Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 152 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am your host, Pravez Ahmed, and I am joined, as always, by the show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, listeners, and Pravez, good to see you. Assalamu alaikum, how are you doing? Wa alaikum salam, good to see you as well. Um, we are uh, back in Berkeley, and Sciences. we are in the Department of Near Eastern Studies um, Library, actually, where we're recording, which uh, I was mentioning this to our, to our respected guest, um, that... For me, as far as I'm concerned, this is like hallowed grounds because we've had some, mashallah, like luminaries who have graced uh, the hallways here as faculty members and, of course, as students. Um, and on so, top of that, yeah. you know, <laughs> for those of you who know Perbiz, you know, he is a uh, yeah. <laughs> bibliophile. Is that the right word? Uh, and he's got an amazing library. You can, you, if you go to his house, you can just geek out <laughs> and looking at his books. Uh, so he's geeking out right now. That's right. Looking around and, and wishing he had, you know, six, seven, eight hours just to easy. do nothing but hang out in this room. Easy, easy, easy. Absolutely. I would, I would easily do that. And uh, another, another nice thing is this chai we're drinking. That's right. Uh, so, I am enjoying this. I, I, you know, Perbez, I usually don't touch caffeine. Yeah. Um, after a certain after yeah. Uh, yeah you're right i have my morning yeah. one or two and then after after afternoon i don't touch it but our our, our guest who we'll introduce here in a minute it was kind enough to make me his uh proprietary uh <laughs> chai uh which is a mix of uh a bunch of things like ginger and maybe some cardamom i'm not exactly sure but it's really good yeah um, it's amazing and Real quick, before we even introduce you, tell us about this chai because it's really good. There you go. I'm, I'm talking to my guest who is <laughs> uh, uh, Rashid, uh, uh, and um, we'll of course introduce him in a second. Yeah. Uh, but tell us about your tell us about your your concoction here. Sure, it's a uh, uh, it's my contribution to the way cultures and flavors intermingle and and come together. Uh, in ways that both pay homage to a tradition, uh, but also attempt to kind of incorporate uh, newness uh, to things. And so given the, the history and the richness of the amalgamation of various cultures and, and flavors on the Silk Road, which is very much home and, and close to, to various layers and levels of, of, of my being and becoming, right. uh, this was a way for me to... Uh, pay respect to some of the uh, the desi chai that I had tasted growing up sure. uh, with friends and in communities uh, and, and, and so forth, uh, but without following anyone's, uh, you know, sort of recipe, uh, it was uh, a, a process of test and trials uh, wherein I think it is similar as you folks may uh, recognize to some of the flavors and some of the te uh, tests that you have. But I, I hope that there are layers and subtleties of differences that really kind of set it uh, aside. So 100%. I've named it Chai Mai. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about that, Chai Mai, why? Right. There, there, there tends to be sort of a this linguistic process that happens in, in Persian or in Farsi yeah. where uh, nouns are repeated uh, with one very important shift, okay. uh, which is that in the second part, the repetition, the first letter of that noun changes to a meme or an M sound, irrespective of what it may be in the original noun. Uh, so it is like a, a playful, but a very common way of referring to things. So it's never used in anger, it's used in, in humor, it's used in playfulness, it's used in, in regular conversations. So for example, chai is very common, and it's common for people to say, or to invite others over by saying, uh, let's have some chai mai. Mm -hmm. So let's have some tea, and the mai, maybe additional things involved to it, uh, mm. and, and added on to it. And um, it leaves the space of curiosity. It leaves the space of maybe adventure or not, or not knowing. Uh, and then also, that it's, a, it's a pun. It's a play because my in English is, of course, uh, a, a possessive. It's like my tea. Mm. So it's both my a take on a tea, but it's also uh, you know homage to this tradition and this language and, and this culture that really much centers uh, this idea of togetherness and hospitality and being together in conversation. Right? Or you anytime you have a good conversation, there's always some tea. There's always something else that that is involved uh, that is involved in it, and it builds a very interesting kind of uh, 
proximity and, and intimacy of minds and of hearts so yeah nice. I'm, I'm really glad you folks like it uh, the, yeah the time, uh, this you is, could probably this is the first time it's being announced publicly <laughs> oh wow <laughs> right. we are honored this is, this is, we are flattered <laughs> and honored you could probably get yourself invited to a good number of parties really? you know you just make it known that you're bringing the, the chai mai and, and you'll get uh you'll get invited but it's, it's, it's funny it's funny because um just this morning Parvez and I happened to bump into each other. Literally, we're both yeah. we just bumped into each other at a Yemeni coffee spot called La Maria, yeah. which is uh, popping up Everywhere. all over big yeah. cities in the U.S. I think it originated in Michigan, right. and now you're seeing different variations, different chains, different franchises popping up. We got our first in the, in Fremont. I know there's a couple in Berkeley and San Francisco. Yeah, and literally, it's lines out the door. Uh, it's a long wait every time you go, but it is amazing. Amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's like I said, I, I'm I'm very picky uh, when it comes to having caffeine, but this this is something yeah. I'm I'm really enjoying. Um, I looked at it and, it, and it's it's kind of light light, very light, uh, but it ha- it packs a it packs a punch when it comes to flavor. So anyway, thank you. It's it's just nice nice little touch here as we do the podcast. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to go quickly go back and and of course we have to properly introduce you. So we're we're trying something a little different here, but we couldn't resist talking about the chai. So I, I was just going to comment on this idea of repetition and nouns um because in urdu you have something similar although there isn't necessarily a um like sort of meme or ma, right like sound uh requirement if you will so for example we'll say ch- we'll rhyme with chai as well but we'll be like you know why don't you come over for some chai by mm-hmm. or something like that mm-hmm. or we'll say um you know so so the, I, i'm blanking right now on other examples of it but we'll do it and and again it's exactly like you mentioned never out of anger out of uh, usually playfulness or uh, certainly love um, and and humor and to just kind of lighten. You would do it among friends. Right. You wouldn't do it in a formal setting, perhaps, that kind of thing. So, I, and of course, Urdu being so derivative and inspired and all of the above from, from Farsi, uh, I, I imagine that's where we got it from. I, I think in English, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, the, uh, it's, it's like saying in stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Right. It, maybe <laughs> not quite. Uh, yes. not, that's the quite right. Like and stuff and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if there is an equivalent. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like uh, yeah. The so in Urdu you do it. That's my theory. In Urdu you do it all. But that, yeah, that is a good theory. Uh, so anyway, we're getting into linguistics and we're getting all these into all these tangents. But um, why don't yeah. you please introduce our guest for us? Yeah, let's let's absolutely do that. We are um, honored to have Ahmed Rashid Salim uh, here with us. He is a doctoral candidate. And and instructor at the Department of Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures at University of California at Berkeley, which we, where we're at right now, uh, in the fields of Islamic studies and Persian literature. His areas of scholarship include classical Persian literature, particularly mystical poetry, translation, Sufism, Quran interpretation, language, and power, Persian literature in Afghanistan, the Kabuli dialect, Shi'i, Sunni polemics, and religious thought in Afghanistan. His dissertation is titled The Harmony of Herat, Words, Wonder, and Worlds in Persian Mystical Poetry and Poetics. Salim is also the founder of Alif Institute, a premier online instruction program for the Persian language with a special emphasis on the Kabuli dialect. He is the author of Islam Explained, a best-selling book utilized in a number of university courses throughout the U.S. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science with a focus on Islamic studies and was awarded a master's degree by the Department of Middle Eastern Studies and Cultures at Berkeley. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Just hearing the bio, is there a difference between the Middle Eastern Studies Department and then the Near Eastern Studies Department? Because I haven't noticed that. Good question. Being very common. It's a, it's a recent name change. I see. It's okay. a recent name change. So, and what's uh, the more recent one then? Uh, Middle Eastern. Okay, uh, I thought so. It used to be Near Eastern Studies, yeah. uh, which was more of a historic term. Uh, and now there's a tendency to shift toward Middle Eastern languages and cultures. Um, okay, because I thought it was Nelk was right. sort of where the movement was, but you're saying milk. it's more Melk? It's now okay. more Melk. Okay. That's, that's been the, yeah. the recent trend that takes place. Yeah. And of course, all of these uh, namings have their own issues and their own histories, right. whether it's Middle East, Near East, uh, right. you know, so. Let's, let's dial, let's go back in time a bit. Um, yeah. Tell us about your, like, your, For sure. where you're originally from, your family origin, I should say, and where you grew up. Yeah. Um, your origin story. As your like origin story. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, so I was born in Kabul and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family history is uh, a bit interesting because uh, 
I have uh, ancestral heritage uh, in three places. One is uh, <clears throat> Bukhara, which is now in, in Uzbekistan. Uh, one is Anatolia, in, in Turkey, of course, and then in Kabul. Um, I come from a line of uh, scholars and Hufaz of the Quran um, who led the Dar al Hufaz in Kabul. They were the heads of Dar al Hufaz in Kabul. Uh, my great grandfather, uh, uh, Hafiz Khizr Muhammad, <clears throat> was the most prominent Hafiz in, in Afghanistan at that time. And um, they were also uh, a group or a lineage of mystics, uh, Sunni Muslims, must, must, mystics. On my maternal side uh, is a series of literary scholars and writers and individuals who were people of the letters and the arts, uh, who are uh, Tajik and Qizilbash, hmm. and they are uh, Shi'i Muslims. So I have these two trends um, with respect to my lineage of both a very pronounced Sunni Islam and a very pronounced Shi'i Islam. Uh, with its own nuances, which uh, I will get to uh, in a bit. Uh, but as a result of the very vicious and violent uh, uncivil wars that occurred in uh, Afghanistan in the 90s, and then the arrival of the Taliban, uh, version 1.0, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. the terror that ensued as a result of that, uh, my parents decided to leave the country, and we eventually ended up in the Bay Area. So I was a kid. I grew up here. I completed my elementary school studies, middle school, high school, uh, collegiate uh, studies, and so forth. And, and what and part of the Bay Area? Yeah, was here in the South Bay. Okay, I grew up in Milpitas. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I grew up in Milpitas, so well, California. At, at that time, when you when, when when your family immigrated here, what was Fremont the sort of you know correct little gobble that it is correct. now? Correct. Right. So you're looking at you know the. Uh, the mid to late 90s, which is in some ways the very peak of mm. the prominence and centrality of Little Kabul and, and Fremont, which later on, uh, saying 2012 onwards, yeah. you see particular shifts take place with movement outside of Fremont to, to other areas like Tracy and, and Antioch and, uh, and so forth. Right. And, and by the way, we're both pretty much from Fremont. <laughs> I, I, right. live, I live in Newark. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I live yeah. in Fremont proper. And right, we've yeah. had guests on the show like like the Majadidi family, et cetera, who, who very much similar stories as to what you're sharing. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, I grew up in, um, uh, in a family, in an, an environment which was very much rooted in knowledge and learning. Uh, my parents were both uh, college educated. My dad taught uh, uh, languages. Uh, he taught French. Um, he also had a background. Uh, so he taught at Kabul University before we came here. Mm. Uh, my mom had a background in physics and mathematics. Um, so they were both, you know, uh, but in addition to that, they were also very much, both my mom and my dad, very much involved in Islamic learning. Okay. So from a very young age, um, most of my primary learning came under the tutelage of my father. So I began with the recitation of the Quran, memorization of the Quran, Islamic history, and so forth. And then, as you know, as I went through these various stages, I also had um, a, a series of what we would call traditional learning. Uh, this traditional learning involved both uh, traditional uh, schooling in Farsi literature, mm -hmm. so studying the classics and the traditional way with a teacher, kind of line by line, discussing it closely. Uh, and then also uh, Islamic studies. Um, so then the expansion of Islamic studies uh, going into, you know, you kind of start off with the basics of Sarf and Nahwa and then going into uh, history and then Tafsir and Akhlaq and, uh, and so forth. How common is that in, in the community, Afghan community? It's not very common, right? Because unfortunately, it's not a, it's not very common now. Because uh, that's but that, pretty that was, intensive, right? I mean, your background, primary education, if you will, is really detailed and, and you, you very. Didn't go, and you didn't go to public school at all, zero. No, I went to public oh, you school. Did. Yeah, no, this I went is to all. This is in addition of, to in it. parallel, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. In addition to it, so not a lot of free time as the kid, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. And then, and then later on, you know. Uh, the seminary studies. I was attached to the seminary in, in Qom and then in Najaf with a number of teachers. Um, so I had kind of these two, these three different routes. Like if I was if yeah. I were to kind of assume that that would be the term for it. One is this formal, uh, you know, let's say secular kind of okay. uh, studies in yeah. the university and and so forth. 
Uh, one is this traditional study in, uh, in language and literature, primarily poetry. Uh, and then the third one is within the realm of uh, Islamic studies, um, traditional Islamic studies. And uh, that involvement led me to be a part of you know the various communities in the Bay Area. Uh, and now I also serve as the Imam at the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California. Oh, really? So okay. I lead the uh, the weekly uh, khutbahs and sermons and, mm. and talks and uh, not as a full-time role because we, for anyone who knows ICCNC, we have sort of a part-time uh, uh, sort of presence. I see. Um, but the center is, is beautiful. It's and it's also a very beautiful way that it absorbs and has place for uh, Muslims, not of their not only of various commitments yes. uh, with respect to their daily performance and and uh, uh, sustenance of Islamic spiritual practice, but also of different madahib. Uh, oh, yeah. So we have on a regular basis, and I think we are one of the very few places in the entire United States where people come. Um, not because there isn't anywhere else to go, because there are very many other uh, right. places to go. It happens at times where some Shi'is will attend Sunni centers because there's no right. Shi'i cent uh, center around, and they do it in a way that is always a bit guarded, and mm -hmm. we can maybe talk about that later. Right. Or Definitely. some Sunnis will come sometimes to a Shi'i center, they're traveling, maybe they don't know, etc. But alhamdulillah, with, with ICCNC, it's a place that people very knowingly and regularly right. come as we try to work on the vision and the commitment to the unity of Muslims, not simply through slogans or not simply as part of a very performative thing, but really for a formative way of creating history because that's exactly what's happening when yeah. Muslims are regularly coming together. There, there isn't this very strong sense of polemics, the strong, the strong sense of like, okay, well, yeah, we have some Sunnis coming in, but we, we got to come up with a program to make them Shi'i and <laughs> you know, and the, yeah. these kinds of things that unfortunately, right. within the the larger Muslim community, for honest, right. there is always this hesitation, there is always this guardedness, this suspicion that takes place, or and unfortunately, in in, in other other instances these ulterior motives around yeah. like well they don't know right now but we're gonna get them going on so no i can i can vouch for that because i remember when i and omar and i yeah. both have been there in fact i think one of our earliest one of my earliest trips when i first moved here we attended a lecture by dr Said hussein nasser uh, -huh. uh at iccnc um i think i've talked about this on the podcast but i, I brought my copy of ideals and realities my little right, beat right. up Beautiful uh, completely in tatters almost because it's, it's been used so much, but he signed it. But anyway, sorry, I, I digress. When I came to ICCNC, the first few times that I attended programs there, for the I, did, I didn't know that it was a Shi'i center because I, I never felt, and I performed my prayers there, I attended programming, as I, as I mentioned, which was very, like you, like you said, very, um, uh, eclectic's not the word, um, persuasions be it ideological or practice level and so yeah I, I completely agree and it's a beautiful for those who don't know it's it's a masonic temple i think right. that was purchased and converted correct uh but yet they've retained uh some of the iconography of like the stained glass and the it's just a beautiful structure right. definitely if anybody visits um go and visit in, Please, in, yes. in oakland Please. yeah yeah and there's Very always nice. now you you mentioned something like about sort of part-time what did you mean by that like i guess the amount of programming that used to be there has it shifted after the pandemic has sort of yes slowed um, down a little also with you know folks working from home mm. and so forth so and pe some people moving mm. uh the the presence of uh some of the regular community members has dwindled uh so when we say part-time it's you know we have regular friday prayers yeah. but we don't have other prayers unless we have a program oh, um, okay. so the the, yeah. the mosque isn't open all the time like some other centers may be right. uh, or some other masajid may be uh, but then we do a lot a lot of uh community involvement so we have weekly food distribution that mm. takes place hot food that is cooked at the center uh that is distributed to unhoused and, and underprivileged folks in the oakland area yeah. and uh, it, this occurs both on wednesdays and fridays and it reaches between 400 to 500 individuals yeah. um so there's a the the center is very very much involved in, in multiple yeah. ways with uh, the community, not just the the Muslim 
community, but the the non-Muslim community as well. We do a lot of outreach with uh, um, Christian and Jewish organizations. We have uh, programs at least twice a year uh, with them. So, yeah. alhamdulillah, there's a there's a lot of these things going on. But yeah, I remember there used to be like an annual iftar program. Oh, of course, yeah. the, during the month of Ramadan, we have yeah. more regular programs, yeah. which include you know pray, uh, prayers and uh, and lecture and uh, iftar that's open to everyone. The month of Muharram as well, we have programs, yeah. uh, especially the first ten nights uh, with prayers and, and right. other things involved. But yeah, so my kind of my my journey is. Is really this amalgamation of, of right. multiple wor worlds uh, and and multiple words because of of the involvement of language, yeah. uh, and then uh, I think you know Alhamdulillah a very unique experience because I came from within a a family tradition uh, that has the presence of very um, a, a, a very sophisticated, if I may, understanding of Islam, okay. uh, which. You know, my father, although he came from a Sunni family, uh, he, it, it's a tradition that is generally referred to as uh, a, a Khurasani kind of okay. uh, Islamic tradition that is very much infused with tasawwuf. Mm. And because of the presence of tasawwuf in this tradition, there are some uh, trends that is referred to as Sunni Twelver uh, tradition. Uh, which, oh, interesting. Sunni Twelver. Sunni Twelver uh, tradition. So it is the tradition that, uh, of course, again, heavily is under the um, uh, the teachings and the cosmology of Tasawwuf and, and of, of Islamic mysticism mm -hmm. that has a deep reverence and a deep adoration and love for the family of the Prophet that goes down the line all the way to what the Shi'is would generally say are the 12 Imams. And you know, within just general tasawwuf as well as for folks who know, the very first uh, works that are written, like Kalabadi's text and, and other texts, have a formulation of the chain uh, of all of the tariqahs and the mm -hmm. chain of receipt of the spiritual uh, endowment and spiritual illumination. So of course, everything starts with the Blessed Prophet, peace mm -hmm. and blessings be upon him and his. And then generally, uh, as you folks may know, within the uh, within the series of, of Tasawwuf, uh, all of the, the Turuq, all of the Tariqahs go through Imam Ali, uh, mm -hmm. except for one, which goes through the, the first Khalif, uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr. Uh, but there's also some historical question about two possibilities being there as well, one going through Imam Ali, one going through uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr. But this is again the, the case, and then through uh, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Zain al Abidin, Baqir, Ja'far, down the line. So, for, for example, Kalabadi list up until uh, Ja'far al Sadiq, then going into uh, uh, Imam Rida and, and others. So, this tradition is very much active mm. uh, in the this region of Khorasan, which captures now what is places like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and, and so forth. But within this tradition, so for example, you, uh, you are very much presently engaged with the remembrance of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay. Um, so my father talks about his father, who again was a, a scholar of the Quran and, and this leader within the community. And he was Sunni. And he was Sunni, right. uh, reciting as a regular prayer in the gathering, and they would have like weekly dhikr sessions and, and things like that. Um, ya Allah, count us amongst the Ansar of Imam al-Mahdi. Hmm. And this is a very unique dua that even some Shi'is don't make every day, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so he, this is kind of the, the background that, that he yeah. comes in. And uh, so when my father is in his, uh, you know, 19, 20 uh, years of age, uh, he was given permission to study most of the texts of my grandfather that, that he had in his personal library. And after a very deep study, uh, he decides to actually change his madhab from the from the Hanafi madhab to the the Jafari madhab. Oh. And this happened. And while maintaining uh, identifying himself as a Sunni. Uh, no, no. So he okay. he he now clearly and openly changes the changes the his madhab from okay. the Hanafi madhab to the, the okay. Ja'fari right. madhab or the Shi'i Isna'ashari Imami madhab. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, without I just the, thought it was like in, just in fiqh. 
You know, do you know what I mean? Right. And right, not right. so much. Okay, but of right. course. So he he yeah. he makes a distinction both in ah. fiqh and then also in the interpretation yeah. of history. Correct. Correct. Uh, right. But this didn't create any tension or schisms within the family. Wow, that's unheard of. Uh, yeah. with, with so there's there's no issues right. or anything like that. Uh, so and so it, I, because I, I mentioned my mother, I don't, I wanted to just clarify that my father had become Shi before mm -hmm. you know meeting my mother because this yeah. wasn't an issue of like oh if you want to marry then you have mm -hmm. to become Shi or something along those lines. But when we were raised. Uh, uh, we were raised uh, in a very unique way wherein although my father had gone through that type mm. of shift and that type of transformation and, and 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 personal growth that for him that led to the acceptance of of the shes we were not create we were not raised in a very uh, kind of um, the confrontational attitude towards Sunnis or towards anything like that. literally the the only thing that would be repeated to us in addition to all of the learning that we did is that, we should be unified as Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be respect and unity of, amongst amongst Muslims. Uh, and this again was very much absorbed in my own understanding, but out in the public, uh, in multiple uh, groups, whether within the Shi'is, whether within the Sunnis, whether in academia, whether in the in, in the in the circle of scholars and others, came, became more and more of a a thing that needed to be protected because not all Muslims have the same view. Right. And that is a, is a, is a deep problem, unfortunately. So, so there's, there's so much I want to unpack. Uh, I think before I begin unpacking some of the things you, you, you've shared with us, I want to just, I was I'm remiss not to do this at the very introduction, was that this episode was meant to focus on, you know, the month of Muharram. Right. And specifically, you know, Ashura and, and, and what that means within the Shi'i tradition. Um, I want to remind our listeners that, you know, this isn't the first time that we've done sort of a deep dive into Shiism. Uh, listeners may recall that we had done an episode with uh, David Coolidge, who very interestingly enough kind of shared his also sort of journey, much like your father's, from obviously outside of the faith and then coming within, coming into Islam and then within Islam his own, uh, his journey from uh, Sunnism to Shiism. So, and then that sort of started, prompted Omar and I to want to do a sort of a deep dive into Shiism. And we had Imam Hadi uh, Qazwini from Southern California on, and we kind of did this whole dive. And much in that same spirit, I wanted to say that our approach then and our approach today is not polemical. Of course. And we're not here for debate. We're not here to tit for tat or whatever, right? I truly want to provide a space where we get to hear from um, someone like yourself and to share specifically, but we can also obviously talk when we have been so far very broadly about Shiism in general, but specifically Muharram, Ashura, and what that means, you know, within the Shi, you know, within the Shi'i tradition. So that's that's just by way of introduction. In terms of beginning to unpack certain things that you've talked about, going really quickly back to Kabul and in Afghanistan, what was the atmosphere like pre-Taliban? I, I, I mentioned the word eclectic when I was trying to describe ICCNC. The word I'm looking for, and this maybe will be sort of a thread throughout the conversation, is ecumenical. Mm -hmm. And so was there an ecumenical spirit or a more ecumenical spirit prior to the advent of the Taliban? in Afghanistan. Like what's the sort of history? Obviously we're not here. We can't do a deep dive, but sure. if you want to just give our listeners kind of a yeah, like an introduction to what life was like in Afghanistan prior to modern sort of, you know, last hundred years. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh so within a, you know, Afghanistan is one of the places that Islam arrives uh, at you know, by the 8th century, most of the spaces that are now referred to as Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which is a modern nation state, right? Previously, it had various names and part of various uh, empires and traditions, hmm. um, is in the 8th century. Okay. Uh, so in the 8th century, Islam comes into this region, and uh, very soon, some of the most profound thinkers and scholars and, and theorists related to the study and the illumination and elucidation of an Islamic uh, ethics and an Islamic worldview come from these these kinds of lands, including uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, whose father is from Kabul, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you have other luminaries within the mystical tradition. You have individuals such as Sana'i of Ghazna. Uh, you have individuals such as uh, Ibn Sina, 
who has roots in Balkh uh, in what is now modern Afghanistan. That's right. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, and, and the list is, is a very long list mm-hmm. of individuals and, uh, and, and luminaries. And Balkh produces, uh, you know, tremendous amounts of Hanafi uh, scholarship. Absolutely. It becomes one of the centers, in fact, of, of Hanafi scholarship. Absolutely. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, Balkh becomes a very central place for, for Hanafi scholarship. Mm-hmm. Um, we have other areas, again, such as, uh, and of course, we can't say Balkh without also mentioning the very famous Jalaluddin Balkhi, known in the West as Rumi, mm-hmm. who is also from within this tradition, within, within this sort of uh, cosmopolitan Mm. Uh, space of scholarship and of culture and, and art and learning. Uh, but in Kabul itself, uh, in fact, um, the presence of Shi'i tendencies uh, go back to this original period. They go of back the to, to the 8th century, century okay. right? 8th century, uh, early 9th century, there are individuals who go from Kabul to places like Mecca, Medina, uh, Kufa and Iraq and, and other places um, as prominent companions of the Shi'i imams. So one individual is uh, Abu Khalid uh, who goes from Kabul and is a, a very prominent companion of the fourth imam, uh, Zainal Abidin, the son of Imam al Hussein. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, the, the presence, the historical presence is Islam and also the, the Shi'i tradition is very much present in this in this land. But the, the country was predominantly a Sunni country uh, with a minority who are Shi'is. However, the relationship, the, the more modern relationship between Shi'is and Sunnis mm-hmm. uh, is one of cooperation and tolerance. Okay? Especially uh, after the 1950s onwards, uh, there is much more uh, sort of efficacy and, and effectiveness around this call for unity, this respect, primarily in Kabul, where it was also common for Shi'i and Sunnis to marry each other. The same was true in, in other big areas such as Herat. Uh, in some other areas, it wasn't so common, right? Um, but Shi'is in Afghanistan are not concentrated just in one place, but Kabul, of course, yeah. as, as the capital, is, is, is a major, major space. However, the Sunnis in Afghanistan also had a historic uh, relationship of uh, love and adoration or veneration, we may even say, of the Prophet's family. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the most common sites of pilgrimage in Afghanistan is in Mazar, um, which is the shrine, it is referred to as uh, Ziyarat al-Sakhi, the shrine of Imam Ali. In Kabul, there's a shrine that is referred to as Shahid al-Shamshira, again, a relationship to the, the Ahlul Bayt. Uh, in the, the shrine in Mazar, which is oftentimes referred to as the Blue Mosque, mm. the view of the common folks and the view of the people in Afghanistan is that that is actually the resting place of Imam Ali, not... Najaf. Najaf. Interesting. Um, and so there's a there's a history of that around the the local culture and and, and things that are completely beyond the, the scope of this conversation. Okay. But when it came to the month of Muharram and particularly the day of Ashura, it was not uncommon for two things to happen. The first is for Sunnis to attend Shi'i Majalis. Okay. For Sunnis to attend Shi'i Majalis. For those who didn't attend Shi'i Majalis, the martyrdom of the grandson of the Prophet, uh, uh, peace and blessings be upon uh, the Prophet and, and his progeny and companions, that martyrdom was front and center with the identification of what Ashura meant. Okay. And the second thing, so if they did not attend the Shi'i centers, and they did, and of course the Sufis also had their own gatherings uh, around the commemoration and memorialization of the events, if they did not attend those uh, those gatherings, they would, or they would do both, is they would create and and pass out what they refer to as nazir, a spiritual sort of extension, a spiritual vowel mm-hmm. of usually halwa uh, or some other cooked sweet. Or it's common. There's this. There's this particular rice pudding that's referred to as shola zard. Um, uh, you can kind of think think of like a rice pudding, but it has saffron. So there's there's 
a certain pronounced color uh, mm. and it's uh, garnished. Different from like in a subcontinent, you have kir. Right, it's, it's different. Than different, that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's very okay. different than that. Okay. Uh, so this was also very common. You would pass it out to neighbors, you would pass it out to relatives, you'd pa pass it out to mm. even people on, on the street as a nazir for the sake of drawing qurbatan ila Allah, drawing proximity to God's mercy while mentioning the name of Imam al Hussein and his status and the commitment and sort of the vow of right. loyalty to the events uh, of, of Muharram and right. uh, and the, the particular event of Ashura. So I say this to to mention that prior to the the uncivil wars in Afghanistan, prior to the arrival of the Taliban who are very much anti-Shi'i, uh, and the, the violence that was uh, meted out on the Shi'is in Afghanistan th by the Taliban, both one uh, version 1.0 and also version 2.0, uh, included attempts at extermination, large attempts at extermination, the prevention of uh, Shi'is gathering to perform uh, you know the the commemorations, the prayers, uh, destruction of libraries. There were multiple libraries that they burnt down, which included very rare manuscripts. So there was a lot of things mm -hmm. going on to that. And then, of course, there is also uh, since the uh, uh, presence of the the Soviet occupation that came, that then resulted in the proliferation of various groups. And as we know, very briefly for for listeners who may not be aware, that the support from the, the US, particularly the CIA, channeling through the ISI of, of Pakistan, Pakistan yeah. and funding from Saudi and other uh, Gulf uh, leaders and, and countries very much uh, was directed with particular aims. And these aims always included disruptions, uh, disruptions mm. that were spiritual and religious, disruptions that were political, disruptions that were social, Social. Most of the leaders, both in Shi'i uh, communities and in Sunni communities, were killed by the Russians during the very first wave of the of the communists. Uh, figures around that vary, and then multiple others were exiled or, or killed mm. by by the Taliban and and others. But but this funding and this money uh, really propped up the most extreme of interpretations when it came to Islam on both so, sides. Uh, Yes, on both sides. Okay. Uh, so the the what we would say is that the common interpretation, the common belief system, the common tradition of what we would say Khurasani Islam, or this the the this this uh, uh, interpretations of uh, of the Shi'i tradition sure. were very much pushed to the side, mm. and there was an attempt to really put the the most extreme uh, interpretations here, which of course absorbs um, the very worst of the Diobandi tradition of of Wahhabism of Salafism right. that have completely different uh, and, and ant antagonistic views to that history that is there. Right. So now, when it comes to interpretations and beliefs around what Muharram is, Shi'i-Sunni relations, there are very prominent changes that have taken place. Still within the country, it seems to be more tolerated. Okay. But here in the diaspora, that some of those tensions have appeared or have been intensified uh, in ways that of course, have reasonings to it. Um, so that's kind of the uh, the very summary uh, representation yeah, of, of what has happened. Uh, but Muharram and, and Ashura and the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein is very much present. It's present in music. It's present in poetry. Right. Uh, I'm in fact writing a book chapter on the history of the memorialization and preservation of the events of Ashura by Sunni poets, both from the classical period yeah. to the modern period, right. which very much complicate this attempt to see it from two contrasting and two um, sort of um, antagonistic Competing. viewpoints, Shi'i, yeah, yeah. Sunni, this binary becomes much uh, sort of challenged and pushed apart. Yeah. Uh, and of course, within that region, within the Persian art world, that tradition of poetry yeah. and the connection to poetry is very vibrant, very active and present. Yeah. In terms of uh, now, with the Taliban in charge, have they kind of outlawed officially some of that stuff? And to what degree, and, and I'm also curious, with the average people day to, in the day-to-day -day life, is that gone or is it still kind of there, just not maybe 
displayed as much. Uh, they've they've banned officially mm. uh, public processions uh, for mourning. Uh, in fact, one of the talking points uh, by, from groups like the Taliban uh, and others during the 20 years of the Republic was that there are too many Shi'i symbols and too many Shi'i uh, iconography, uh, uh, iconography yeah. and tolerance of Shi'is in society now. Mm. Uh, uh, and this was, again, when you look at TV programming, when you look at this, in fact, in the last 20 years, and the last 20 years, of course, deserves its critique of, of various things, but we cannot use that to justify the yeah. uh, the very uh, evil um, uh, work that is being done by the Taliban and the oppression that's being done by the Taliban, which I should say that unfortunately within uh, the Muslim circles is oftentimes erased and ignored and justified under this guise of, well, you know, the United States killed yeah. civilians. Yes, of course, the United States killed civilians, but the Taliban are killing civilians right now. That is not being reported. So, mm. um, yes, publicly they have uh, banned uh, public processions and mourning right. processions. They have, uh, in fact, uh, removed uh, banners from uh, what we refer to as Husseiniyas, these sites that are particularly the sites of commemoration for the events of Muharram, of Masajid. Mm. Uh, there have been a series of assassinations and killings. Of course, we know within the last 20 years. Um, there have been a series of suicide bombings uh, that were directed by the Taliban against Shi'i Muslims, mm -hmm. in addition to other civilians. But many Shi'i mosques were bombed and uh, Qur'ans destroyed, innocent right. civilians killed and, and, and butchered. So the history of violence is very much mm -hmm. present and very much felt and, in and Afghanistan. You would, and you would argue that, that, that a lot of that is the result of foreign influence. Absolutely. Okay. So be it the CIA, petrol money pouring into the region, all beginning in the... It really picks up yeah, uh, after 80s. 1979. 1979, right. So we right. have two trends, right? One yeah. is anti the, the growth of anti-Shi'i literature yeah. after I misspoke, the yeah. 79 yeah. Islamic Revolution. Exactly. And concurrently... Um, the, the the vying and the lobbying for these various armed groups after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 79 as well. Yes. That's right. A lot happens in 79. Uh, meanwhile, neighboring Pakistan, uh, General Zia comes into power and, and a lot of that money is you know coming into Afghanistan, all with an agenda, like you said. Right. The influence of Dale Bundy slash even Wahhabi sort of influenced seminaries that were Propping up everywhere. Right. That's also the case. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Particularly for those yeah. um, without lived experience in Afghanistan. I see. Many of the purely the, foreign. Correct. Is that what you're saying? Uh, correct. They yeah. lived primarily in Pakistan. Yeah. So, sometimes in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they went to Arab countries and they came back. And because you don't have that lived experience, that socialization, or I would even call it. Uh, so, you know, I have. I look at akhlaq and yeah. adab um, as this ethical spiritual refinement that is part of the Islamic ethics of civilization, of, of this becoming, this this blossoming, right? This includes in it a, a uh, an insistence and centrality of plurality mm -hmm. in interpretations, in relations with other individuals and so forth, wherein the very antagonistic and very sort of... Uh, we would call the extreme interpretations, right? The fringe interpretations of religion is that if you disagree with my interpretation, I will deploy and employ violence to either force you to agree to it or to remove you, right? And, and this is a this is a difference. Now, I do want to add this uh, this caveat, which is the the problems in the Muslim world are not simply from the outside. There is, of course, a very deep tradition of polemics, a mm -hmm. deep tradition of dehumanization, a, a long tradition of, at times, uh, you know, the exploitation of religious sentiments for political gains. Sure. Uh, in fact, uh, historically in Kabul, we were talking about Kabul, uh, there is a, a certain slaughter that happens of the Qizilbash, which are primarily uh, Irano-Turkic uh, Shi'is. Okay. Um, very prominent part of the history and the formations of, of Kabul. Uh, the Qizilbash uh, are seen as a political threat because of their status, because of their organization, number of intellectuals and leaders. So how can we then challenge this? The kings and, and the rulers are thinking, well, how can we challenge, how can we remove them? So then 
a riot breaks out because there's an accusation that a, a Sunni Hanafi boy was wronged by a member of the Qizabash. Okay. And that leads to conflict, that leads to the leaders being killed and so forth. And well, who does that aid? Who that aided the central rulers? Uh, and we see this the way that, again, uh, polemics or yeah. what we call sectarianism mm -hmm. are deployed within by Muslims to, to really kind of one up the other side or to defeat as as they would say in, in quotes the other side and that's not unique just to afghanistan of course, or kabul it's everywhere right and we see it with uh empires throughout muslim history uh that employed that level of sort of um, you know sectarian subjugation violence civil unrest for political aims right and and we can spend a lot of time i think talking about sort of like the political side of things but i really want to sort of get to the to the core of if you could help our listeners and help, me, and help us um, sort of situate Muharram within the Shi'i tradition, sure. and more specifically, I would imagine, the events of Ashura. Sure. Right. So let's, let's do that. I mean, and, and I think maybe a starting point would be something you've already touched on, is the centrality of Ahl al-Bayt within the Shi'i tradition, and where maybe some of the differences lie between normative Sunni approaches to normative Shi'i approaches. I know that's a lot. No, 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 this, this is excellent. <laughs> uh, so allow me to just take But to one... me, this is like the meat of the conversation. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, allow me to take just one step sure, back. Sure, please. Which is to say that uh, maybe sometimes we Muslims do not really understand the key difference between the Shi'i and the Sunni tradition. Sure. Uh, and particularly, uh, if I may, there is a unique kind of disinformation that is directed around what Shi'i Islam is mm -hmm. and what Shi'i Islam believes that includes a number of fallacies and, and falsehoods, uh, including that the Shi'is believe in a different Quran, that the Shi'is believe that Ali should have been the prophet or that they worship Ali or that they worship the Imams or that the Imams are God, uh, that the, the Shi'is have a foundational commitment to uh, offensive language and cursing of the Sahabi of the, of the Prophet and, and these kinds of things, sure. which, are, which are false. Uh, there is only one Quran that Muslims have, uh, but, uh, and, and prophethood is a, the finality of prophet is of course something that Muslims believe in, Shi'is believe this. Uh, Sunnis believe this. Uh, Imam Ali is not considered God. He is not considered to be a prophet, and so and so forth. And, sure. and same thing, disrespect towards the wife and and the, the wives and the companions of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his, is not part of Shi'i practice. We have Muslims who have all kinds of uh, practices, all kinds of beliefs that they attempt to center as the primary representation of the religion, but. The way that we as American Muslims demand fairness and demand integrity of whether it's moral integrity, intellectual in integrity around antagonistic and misinformed representations or rather misrepresentations of what Islam is around, you know, the attempts of being violent against all Christians sure. rooted in this violent form of jihad and all of these different things. And we say, well, look at the tradition, look at this, yeah. or allow us to speak. Um, you know, the way that you mm. folks are most Muslims will have these demands to, from for non-Muslims, exactly. but they will refuse to offer these the same space and the same sincerity and conversation to other Muslims, yeah. right? Intra faith. Intra faith, exactly. Exactly. The key difference between the Shi'i tradition and the Sunni tradition is not in with respect to the Quran, prayers, or anything like that. It's with respect to what happens yeah. in leadership after the Prophet. That's right. And it comes down to the Shi'i view that after the Prophet's rahla from this, this temporary world, the Prophet had designated his cousin and his son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, to be the leader of the Muslims. And the argument that Shi'is make is that this leadership, this was not simply a suggestion and leaving the choice to the community, but this was a affirmation and confirmation sure. that he is not simply a political uh, uh, leader and ruler but he is he also has the spiritual perfection a very uh, unique 
kind of spiritual perfection and esoteric understanding as well as the esoteric understanding of religion yeah. that has to be sustained in order for a clear understanding of Islam to continue and the safety of the community yeah. to continue. This I'm referring to is with respect to the concept of walaya, okay. of the, the leadership of the Ahlul Bayt. And from the Shi'i tradition, the Ahlul Bayt is a very specific and a very contained term sure. that, that usually uh, they utilize verse 33 uh of chapter 32 Surah Al-Ahzab, the very famous ayah of Tathir. That's right. The, the ayah of purification. And then there's the Asbab al-Nuzul that is included. So this is a, a long conversation which yeah. then says that technically that the Ahlul Bayt are the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his, his daughter Fatima, mm -hmm. uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and then their two sons, Hassan and Hussein. They're all also referred to as people of the cloak, cloak. Uh, like Kisa and, right. uh, and Panchtan and, and some other yeah. traditions. Again, Sunni, uh, Sunni Shi'i, etc. Yeah. But the Shi'i belief is that this Ahlul Bayt has the continuation of leadership okay. and the right of leadership, while in the Sunni tradition, as, as you know, the, the idea is that the vote and the choice is left to the uh, to the public and and all this. There's a really excellent book I think that for for those who are interested in sort of the the depth of this conversation uh, in the English language. I think really the best book, the most academic work in the English language, is by uh, Professor Madelung, The Succession to Muhammad. For those who may be interested, it's a very uh, I wonder if you have it. Yeah. Uh, really excellent excellent book. It is. Yeah. But so within a certain history unfolds right after yeah. the the passing of of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon on him and his 11 years after the you know the hijra to uh, medina uh, and then there's the formation of the the khalifat the the the, the presence of, of hazrat abu bakr and then umar and then usman we have two assassinations that happen as you mm -hmm. know the assassination of umar the assassination of usman and then you know the 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 selection of ali as the fourth caliph but at this time, we have a tremendous amount of rebellions that take place. Of course, the famous case of the Khawarij. Mm. But also, then we have from Sham, yeah. Muawiyah. That's right. And this is really, I think, the starting point. Some would go even earlier, but okay. really the starting point of understanding why sure. Muharram and Ashura unfold. Uh, the war that happens between uh, Imam Ali and, and Muawiyah is a war that leads to the shedding of Muslim blood, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it includes the uh, the martyrdom of the Prophet's companion, Ammar, the very famous narration that the Prophet had said that the the group that is baghiya, the group that is rebellious and contradictory to the norms and the ethical norms of Islam will kill Ammar. And, and so there's this, this entire history that is linked there. And then with Imam Ali's assassination, Within traditional uh, Sunni historiography, there is the fifth caliph is referred to as Hassan in in in, in some instances. But Muawiyah essentially generally takes, speaking uh, takes, uh, takes control. Right. And then there is a peace treaty that is signed between Muawiyah and Hassan. Okay. And this peace treaty essentially is situated on an agreement that Muawiyah will not make the rule hereditary. That he, that after his death the uh, rule and leadership of the Muslim community would come back to Imam Hassan, the son, the eldest son of um, Sayyidina Ali, uh, Sayyidina Ali mm -hmm. uh, salam Allah alayhi, and Bibi Fatima, Bibi salam Allah alayha, the grandson of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his, whom is very well known to the Muslims. I mean, Sayyidah Shabab Ahl al-Jannah, the fragrance of heaven, all of these various things that we don't need to go into uh, mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Essentially what happens is, my, is Islamic history is very clear, right? So my reading of Islamic history, both as an academic and as a Muslim, is really to avoid the emotionalism and to avoid kind of the selectivity that we that we have been really embroiled in. And to get to a point where Muslims can discuss history, the... Uh, let's say the dark chapters of history, the uncomfortable aspects of history, and understand that history is never pleasant, mm -hmm. right? And by keeping it or sidelining it or coloring it a different way, we're not saving anyone's faith. We're harming ourselves. We're harming the the vibrancy of of Islam. But 
I say this because if we have the ability as Muslims, uh, as decent human beings, to discuss these things and maybe even come to to differing conclusions without saying, well, if you disagree with me, then you're not a good enough Muslim. Or you're, or you're excommunicated. Or you're excommunicated, yeah, yeah, you're right? Which what generally happens. Yeah. It's not even you're... Anathematized. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is I think then we have the chance of... Sure. progress sure. right and i sure. really appreciate it. it's beautiful um going through a very complicated history um you mentioned wilayat and and sort of temporal worldly political leadership uh, and then i brought up the idea of like isma or uh, infallibility sure. of a religious understanding can you tie those two principles like wh what is the interplay between those two concepts in shiism specifically sure yes uh, I, I, that's an excellent yeah. point thank you for for bringing mm -hmm. that up so i smell or this this idea of infallibility right uh, not an infallibility that means that the individual does not have control or they do not have choice but that they have such a spiritual perfection that is granted and bestowed by god yes. that they they would never engage in anything haram, let alone anything makruh or, or, or mubah or anything like that. And uh, the, the Shi'i cosmology, and this of course also ties in with, with various uh, traditions within, within Sunni tradition as well, because there's a lot of interplay that takes place sure. in, in many different areas and many different ways, is that prophets have infallibility. Right. They have infallibility because they have been selected by God and sent to the people to serve as a medium to recognizing God. And it is argued then that because the the focus of the prophets is to gu guide people towards God, uh, towards God, there has to be an infallibility, right. meaning that there isn't a personal attachment or personal tendency to deviate from that message because of various temptations or various preferences. Uh, so they take they bring this then, of course, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace right. and blessings be upon him and his, and you know, multiple kind of uh, reasonings and corroborations are offered. I'll just briefly mention a few of them. One of them is this ayah of Tathir, uh, referring to a thorough purification, right? right? Um, in, in chapter 33, verse 33 of the, of the Quran, that God desires to remove impurities, and there's an entire esoteric and exoteric explanation of that from you, uh, O people of the house, ya Ahlul Bayt, uh, tathira, and to grant you this complete, this thorough purification. So then it's argued that, well, this purification isn't a reference to any kind of physical purification, right? Because everyone needs to do wudu and ghusl and all of these things, but it has to be a spiritual purification purification and that spiritual pur purification is then tied to this idea of isma uh, in addition to that uh, you know they'll they'll refer to the the very famous verse of the quran hawa, that the prophet does not speak from personal or based or, or based desires that that even the speech of the prophet peace and blessings be upon him and his is rooted in this truth right Wahi. and then um the distinction is made between wahi and and, yeah. and the speech of the prophet of course right. that it is informed by this the the speech and then of course they'll say can you find anything in the life of the prophet that would uh show a contradiction between the sharia and and, and all of these things and no yeah. and the same thing is then added to the ahlul bayt not that they are prophets they, okay. there can be no other prophet so prophet. but i think that's a good like maybe a pause because yes. i think that I mean, again speaking from a from a sunni tradition we, we're in complete harmony there. Like everything you mentioned about the infallibility of prior prophets, of the Prophet Sallallahu the reasoning behind it, the rationale behind it, all of that is like, gen is agreed upon en masse among Muslims so far. Yes. Now. With exceptions. No, no, yes. please. Yes. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, but let's just say normative Sunni and Shi tradition. Yes. Affords us that understanding? Yes. I mean, yes. would you... Yes. Uh, the, when Concede I, when, that point? Yes, I would. Yes. Okay. But now, this, this conversation around Ahl al-Bayt, I think there's an argument to be made that I don't think that even that is a point of departure, but I'll let you sure. sort of flesh that out. Sure. Because some would argue that, that, that there might be, that that might, as the sort of point of departure between Sunni and Shi, you know, yes. readings of history and understanding of both Wilaya and Esma. Yes. Um, so within within this tradition, so we've established the, of course, the, the isma, the infallibility of the sure. prophet. It's extended to the ahlul bayt, not simply because that they are the household of the prophet, because we've had other prophets who've had households, famously, 
Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, uh, who deviated from that prophetic tradition, other prophets as well, but that they have been, according to the nas of the Qur'an, the very text of the Qur'an, and the verifiable and, and vetted ahadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his, pointing to the fact that there is something unique and uh, prominent that distinguishes as Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, mm -hmm. not simply in the realm of respect, but in the realm of spiritual excellence. Okay. A spiritual excellence that is not attainable to the same degree and to the same excellence by those who are outside of the qualification and the naming of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi okay. salatu um, and, and that's far more in inclusive than just the five, for example, or just, yeah, so. So yeah. the Ahlul Bayt, yeah. the, the very progeny of the Prophet, and we, all Muslims know that the Prophet after, uh, you know, Bibi Khadija, Salam Allah Alayha, mm -hmm. married, he had other wives, but he never had any surviving children. Mm -hmm. So the progeny of the Prophet is established only through one line, which is his daughter Fatima, Salam Allah Alayha, and her husband Ali ibn Abi Talib, Alayhi Salam. And then from that, there two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. Mm -hmm. And within Islamic and, and, and Shi'i esotericism, there's also a very interesting relation. The Prophet had two sons who died in infancy. And two sons come, and we know that uh, they would be referred to as Ibn Rasulullah, the, the sons of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon, upon him and his. Um, so the Ahlul Bayt from the Shi'i definition is only this line. It doesn't include the wives of the Prophet, which is a, a, a point of contention between Shi'i readings uh, in Tafsir and Sunni readings in Tafsir. We don't have to get into that because I think yeah. as much as the, the, I enjoy this conversation, I also know that we can't sit here for seven hours and, and talk about all of this, right? <laughs> exactly. So the, so, li the line... But, so is, is there a distinction afforded to uh, like Ummahatul Mu'minin, for example, from the from the Sunni perspective. Right, right. What is the sort of Shi'i reading of that then? Yeah, so Shi'is, in addition to kind of some verses or some some, way, some things that occurred in Islamic history. Right? I, like I, the I should say uh, mothers of the believers. Sorry, of, I didn't translate. Mu'minin, yeah. The mothers of the of the believers, referring from, specifically to the wives of the Prophet, right, peace be upon him. Right, exactly, his, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know, within within the the general Sunni reading is that the Ahlul Bayt include the wives of the Prophet, and they are included in that verse because, you know, Surah Al-Ahzab, if you look at this verse, the, the earlier verses refer to the wives of the Prophet, yeah. and then there's a, sh there's a shift. Mm -hmm. um, and that shift from within the Shi'i reading and grammatically goes from the plural feminine to the plural masculine, which of course includes the, f the feminine as well. Yeah. And then they would point to this asbab al nuzul that is contained in some Sunni traditions like Ibn Kasir and, uh, and others, referring to the Prophet's uh, blessed wife, Um Salama, saying that when this verse was being revealed, the Prophet sees uh, Fatima and then Ali and then Hassan and Hussein and invites them and sits them under this Yemeni cloak, this kisa, right? right. This verse is, re is, is revealed and, and the Prophet raises his hands, I'm summarizing here, and says sure. that, oh Allah, this is my Ahlul Bayt, love those who love them and be against those who are against them. And she's saying that, Um Salama here, that I was watching this and I saw, you know, of course, the excellence of what's happening and I said, Can, may I also enter under that cloak and the response that is received is you are fine where you are so there is a an honor there is a, a, a an excellence there but there is a distinction there's a demarcation that happens and there's a border in a way if we may yeah. that, that that takes right. place here so for shi'is the 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 asma uh, of the prophets are passed to their to the wasi the representative or the vice gerent of the prophet after him contained in this idea of walaya this idea of of spiritual authority and yeah. spiritual leadership that is both political right. and uh, and material in the realm of tafsir, in the realm of, of sunan, of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his, of the sharia, ah, and of the esoteric, you know, tazkiyah that we would talk about uh, in Islam. And this idea of walaya is contained in this, the notion of imamat, uh, okay. that there are 12 imams, 12 leaders from the line of the Prophet, the, the progeny of the Prophet, the first of them being Ali, mm -hmm. And the last of them being the Mahdi, whom all Muslims uh, believe will be coming back, right? This kind of, 
I, idea around the end times, the return of, of Prophet Isa, Salamullah alayhi, uh, and the Mahdi's role in you know fighting Dajjal, the, the establishment of a just governance, and all of these various things that uh, that are there. But for for Shi'i Muslims, Imama and, and Walaya are contained in the 12 Imams and the 14 Ma'sumin, the 14 infallible uh, people of the household of the Prophet. The Prophet being the first, Bibi Fatima being the second, uh, Salam Allah alayha, Sallallahu alayhi Sayyidina Muhammad wa Ali, and then the 12 Imams, right? Now, I want to just briefly, since we're talking about family, yeah. mention why Bibi Fatima, uh, Salam Allah alayha, is mentioned here and contained in this uh this formula of, of infallibility of, of the 14 of the, uh, the ma'asumin uh, yeah. so she is the continuation of the prophet's the progeny sure and then she is will point to various sayings of the prophet of course but something also in particular which is surah al-kawthar wherein it says ba'da basmala bismillahir rahmanir rahim inna a'tayna kal kawthar and kawthar understood differently by different words both being sort of this this health in in jannah right. being meaning abundance meaning excellence but the the this verse essentially the surah one of the shorter surahs shorter surahs in the quran with, with three verses talks about that the enemies of the prophet are abtar that's right, right. and abtar within the arabic language refers to that which has been cut off the tail being cut off and arabs used it as a derogatory term to refer to anyone who did not have male Proge heirs Marianne, that exactly. would then continue the line uh, the prophet only had daughters who survived right. now why is this important because the the end says that it is your enemies who are who are aptar. so they continue there's an actual shift that happens which is very interesting there's a shift that happens from a male-centric approach to the continuation and identification of a line mm. to a female-centered one which is fatima mm. um uh, so so yes this is this is the 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 shi'i view right. around around Beautiful. isma that it is contained there and anything outside of that people can live very pure uh, lives but they're still human beings that that are outside of this I you know unless they're children and, sure. uh, and other things yes no I, I really appreciate that, uh, the breakdown I but I think um, just for academic purposes sure. though there is some like khilaf within like the Shia approach to all 12 being uh, part of the the infallible imams correct no 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 because but but, but the, um, sorry, Zaydis. Uh, I see. I or, see. Yeah, yeah. I see. So right. There's a uh, break after, at five or seven, depending on if you're right. Ismaili well, or right. Like, okay, I see what you. Sorry. Mean. Sorry. I. I no, as yeah. a as a Shi'i ithna ashari. That's right. I, that's as, right. A, as a twelver Shi'i, I, I I I was speaking from within that. Of within course. That tradition. Of course. Yes. Absolutely. That's what within I wanted the to mention. Shi'i tradition, yeah. there are other groups and other other movements. Mm -hmm. um, Minorities a, within right uh, Shi'ism. Uh, but they were they they deserve their own space and and the qualifications with respect to their their views. There's a Zaidiya, there's a Ismailiya, there's others who who've who've kind of died out in in time. But the prominent ones are the Zaidiya and and the Ismailiya, uh, who have for them you know living imams, especially the 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 Ismailiya yeah. uh, and the the person of the the Aga Khan. Uh, but within the uh, the Ithna Ashari, uh, it is only 12, that's nothing right. more than that, nothing uh, added to that. Yes. That's right, that's yes. right. And then also within the Ithna Ashari, the 12 are, uh, which again is, represents, you know, the sort of majoritarian within Shi is, um, is uh, the imam who is in occultation. Correct. If you could just touch on that sure, as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So the, there, is, there is the presence of oppression so for shi'i yeah. islam the the oppression that the household of the prophet experiences both during the life of the prophet and that we know for example cases of the shab abi talib when the prophet and his family and a few of the companions and followers are exiled and they're living essentially in caves right yeah. outside of, of mecca the violence and the pressures against uh abu talib the, the the pressures and the violence against the prophet himself you know all of these different things there is this history of suffering and sacrifice and oppression that is very much formative, both of the experience of how injustice unfolds in this world, but also of this loyalty to the protection and preservation of this prophetic line, right? Okay. Um, and uh, so all of the Imams are martyred. 
Ali is martyred. Uh, as I was talking about uh, the, the peace treaty between Imam Hassan. Let's come back to that uh, for and, sure, and, because and, that gets us to the yes, events of Muharram. But uh, I Imam, just wanted to yes, touch yes, on these course. more sort of ideological. Yes, yes. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Um, so he gets martyred as yeah. well. Of course, uh, Hussein yeah, uh, is martyred. So the, the entire line of the imams are martyred comes to the 11th imam, Hassan al-Askari, mm -hmm. uh, and then there is this pressure around ensuring that he is in prison, that there's no child, because mm -hmm. they serve as a political threat. Uh, to Does he exist during the time of the Umayyads the, or the Abbasids? The Abbasids. Abbasids, Abbasids, I thought so. And, and real quick, are, is, yeah. the, is each subsequent imam the, the oldest son or anything like that? How yeah. does, usually how does... usually it's, it's, it's the oldest son with some exceptions. Okay. Now, um, yeah. The, the the other thing from from within the Shi'i tradition is that the the imam announces the next imam succession, right? So there's always this 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 check, this affirmation, this attestation that the imam knows the next imam, etc. There's some narrations that say that the prophet gave all twelve names of the imam, <clears throat> but you know generally yeah. uh, the imam tells the, who the next right. imam is, etc. To be fair, again, like like you mentioned, this idea of succession being vocalized and being made public. Um, you know, uh, both from Sunni tradition and Shi'i tradition, recognizing, for example, the events of Ghadir Qum and mm -hmm. and 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 what the Prophet says, right. and you know, and the significance that was placed on Ali, Sayyidina Ali specifically, uh, is something that is a point of con contestation. Uh, but I think it is something that is found in both in both sources. Yes, absolutely. Uh, is what I want to make clear. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for for bringing that, yeah. that up. I kind of glossed over that. I skipped yeah. it because again, Islamic history is so rich, and this topic sure, is, uh, is sure, so, sure, is so sure. rich. But but to your point, uh, you know, there is the and Shi'is would generally argue this is that a lot of the claims that Shi'is say that we're making, or a lot of a lot of the readings that we're doing of Islamic history, these are not things that we were just making up. That there's evidence of this within the Sunni tradition as well. Um, uh, and, and this is then, again, both productive and at some times <laughs> Complicated for for it's ways that we that we understand things, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, yeah. But um, Hassan Askari has a son. Okay. The name of the the Mahdi. Now here's here's the big issue that happens. That the the Shi'i belief is that the Mahdi he was born the twelfth Imam he was born, and as a result uh, for a need of protection, he had to be guarded and he had to be protected from the uh, from being out in public. So people knew him, people came to him, etc. And he was with the people for a certain amount of time. And then by the will of God, there has to be a minor occultation. Uh, the minor occultation is that he had a number of representatives to whom he would convey messages that would be sent, that would be uh, directed to people. Okay. People would uh, uh, direct messages through them to kind of guide the community. And then there's a major occultation that happens, right? The major occultation is that the the imam is hidden from the eyes of people, but he is alive and he is sustained with God. Right. Now this may seem, you know, to be honest, it may seem a very Fan unusual thing. A fantastical. Very, a very fantastical to thing. To say the right? least. Of yeah. course. Right. Um, and then Shi'is would generally point to a number of things, such as the belief in the continuation of the life of Prophet Nuh السلام, for say mm -hmm. over 900 years. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about the Muslim belief that uh, uh, Hazrat Isa عليه, is not crucified and he's alive, sustained. The, the verse in the Quran talking about the shuhada, that they are not dead, but they are being sustenance and they're being provided for with God. And they'll say, well, if if the Quran is talking about shuhada like this, or the Quran is talking about uh, Prophet uh, Isa, sallallahu alayhi, and so forth, mm -hmm. then this isn't a really unusual thing. Mm -hmm. And they would say that the status of the imam is higher than that of the shaheed. The status of the prophet is higher than the status of a shaheed. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyone can go, may all the shuhada, particularly the shuhada in Palestine and, and Yemen and Afghanistan, Lebanon, all of these different places, and, and all of our shuhada throughout Islamic history, maybe the, they be elevated. I mean, but anyone can be, right. you know, invited towards the shahada. Right. But if God is saying that the shaheed has that kind of life and sustenance and existence, then it's not unusual for the imam to have it. That's so right. the, the, the Shi'is believe that he is in major occultation, that mm -hmm. he is hidden from the eyes, but he is spiritually still present and, mm -hmm. and, and active and provided for by God. 
and he will return. And the return happens, just like it, it is noted in the Sunni tradition as well, right. with the exception that in the Sunni tradition, it's usually understood that he is yet to be born. Correct. But within the Shi'i tradition, the view is that he is alive and he, he is born. Right. Uh, so, yes. Did he have any... Why Why did it stop there, I guess? Why did the, uh, why did the chain of imams stop at 12... Right. Is there a specific reason for that? Did he not have children? Uh, or was that kind of predetermined? Yeah, great, that's an excellent, great excellent question. point. Yeah. So within the Shi'i tradition, usually when the uh, the reasonings for imama are, are offered or understood, imama is tied to nubuwa, prophecy and, 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 and prophethood. And Shi'is will say, just like human beings have no decision and choice in picking who is who is a prophet, nor have they ever, or how many prophets uh, have been sent. The same is true of imam or, or walaya or the wasi of, of, of the prophet. So the number is predetermined, they would say, by God. It, it cannot be added from within at, at least the ithna ashari, the ithna ashari essentially meaning 12 mm -hmm. uh, Shi'is, but while in the in the Zaydiya or in the, Isma, the Ismailiya uh, Ismailia tradition, then the number is, is much more extens extensive and continuous. As I noted, the, you know, the Ismailis currently with the, with the Agha Khan Correct. and then his children and others. So that is mm -hmm. a continuous line. But within the, right. the Ithna Ashari view, mm -hmm. the view is that the number is 12, the number was predetermined as 12, and okay. it will never change. Okay. Um, so that's uh, and and they would point to that being a predetermined divine ordinance, not something that is right. uh, that is kind of left open to modification. Right. And as you mentioned, I mean, there are sources probably that that uh, Shi'is recognize where even the prophet may have said or or, or uh, prophesized about the twelve and things like yes, that. Yes, yes, right. and yeah, exactly. The, and the, I think the, that also probably should be worth noting is that you know when it comes to um, Hadith literature, there is some disagreement between the sources among Sh Sunnis and Shis. Yes, yes, so that uh, the, should be noted, and I think uh, a lot of Sunnis don't realize. That. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, the, so, so the, uh, you're right. The number twelve. Yeah. I mean, there are some hadith uh, in, in the in the Sahih Sitra that point to the number twelve, the twelve leaders after me, the twelve caliphs after me, etc. And you know, Shis would generally say, "Well, we don't have who are these twelve leaders? Mm -hmm. Who are these twelve caliphs? Because historically, there have been many more than that." And so right. they'll say, "Well, this is maybe an adulteration or a modification of." the 12 I imams see. and so forth okay. and your point about the ahadith and thank you for bringing this yeah. up this is uh, again a really uh, important distinction is that unlike the sunni tradition wherein the the uh, the the senate or the chain of narration is the prophet and generally the ashab of the prophet the companions of the prophet um within the shi'i tradition it is the prophet and then the family of the prophet. Mm -hmm. The family of the prophet is much more prominent, or I may say that they are the most prominent facet of the prophetic sayings and the prophetic uh, tradition, the, the hadith. Um, and and you know, there's reasons Shi'is would argue because you spend more time with your family members, sure. and the, they would say that the longest kind of companion to the prophet is Ali, who lived with the prophet, who was raised by him, who was one of the first to pray with him, in addition to uh, say the Khadija, salam Allah alayhi, uh -huh, uh, and so forth. And then one other thing is very important within the Shi'i tradition. The Shi'i tradition does not recognize any book of narration, any book of hadith as sahih. This title of sahih mm -hmm. is not... Uh, added or applied to any book of a hadith. Then the view being that a hadith is that one realm in which there is a tremendous number of contestations, fabrications. We have, of course, the whole uh, you know field of Israeliyat and the absorption of sort of this Judeo-Christian right. uh, tradition within within the Hadith literature. Yeah. And uh, you know, as we know historically as well, whether the Abbasids, whether the Umayyads, there were very active attempts to fabricate narrations in, uh, in the name of the Blessed Prophet for political purposes. For political purposes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and you know there there's actually excellent w uh, work done by uh, you know in academia by Professor uh, uh, Nabil uh, Hussein around the rehabilitation of uh, of Imam Ali in the Sunni uh, <laughs> tradition. It's a very uh, interesting. He's an he has an article and then he he has a uh, a book yeah. around it. Yeah. 
but yes, so in the Shi'i tradition, in the Shi'i reading of history, the, the, the term Sahih as a book doesn't exist. Okay. And the most the earliest and most prominent extant collection that we have is Kulaini. Right. And Kulaini in his very introduction says that what you find in this book, if it disagrees with the Quran, reject it. Because my aim is not to say everything that's captured here is valid and vetted but sure. this is what was in circulation amongst the people okay and that's the approach that shi'is would take to the entire corpus of yes. hadith literature of hadith literature nothing uh, there's no gradation there's oh, no of course yeah, the, 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 there the, is the, yes the gradations okay. and and such happen okay the, but i'm saying that no one collection uh, correct. of the yeah. canonical collections that that's exist right. uh in the shi'i tradition is, is usually four well of course as you know in the sunni tradition it's seven yeah. uh at least the ones that have that have uh, that have survived and that are extant uh but none of them have the same title sahih right, right. like within the sunni tradition after the quran Sahih Bukhari. Bukhari is considered to be just purely like vetted and, and, and sure. true, but Shi'is don't have that kind of view. In addition to the Prophet, the Shi'is also absorb the sayings of the Ahlul Bayt, the, the Imams, and Bibi Fatima. They usually technically refer to as Rawayat, the, the attributions and the sayings from them. And those also hold tremendous weight. Um, and they are also understood to be a mirror or an extension of prophetic sayings. So many ways the prophetic prophetic sayings continue wherein the imams will say, I heard from my father, who heard from his father, who heard from his father, that the prophet of God said this, you see? So that chain of narration yeah, wherein within the Sunni tradition it may primarily be say Abu Huraira and, and, and so forth. Right. In the Shi'i tradition it, it is going to be very, very understood. Different. Yes. Understood. Thank you. Uh, that's. It's a great, I think, overview, but it, it, it obviously is a departure from where we were trying to get to. Yes. And that's my fault. No, but, no, no. <laughs> but but um, we were talking about uh, the events around the peace treaty yes. between Muawiyah and uh, Imam Hassan. Yes, yeah. correct. Okay. So let's start there because sure. obviously that's going to take us to um, Muharram, uh, the events of uh, Ashura and what that means and its significance, which is, again, what we were trying to focus on. Sure, sure. We may have to do a part two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the peace treaty is very important. Uh, the peace treaty, I may offer, uh, one way to look at the very life of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his, is of course a network of peace treaties that the Prophet uh, mm -hmm. engages in as a way of sustaining coexistence. Correct. It may be disagreement in many instances, but an aversion to war, of an aversion to, to violence, especially to initiating war, which of course is very important uh, to counter this idea of Islam being very much into expansionism and into, into violence, something that does happen after the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And of course we see uh, a heightening of that during the Umayyad and Abbasid and, and other subsequent sure. dynasties that happen. So the, the peace treaty or this, this prophetic tendency to come to mediation or uh -huh. to, to come to a peace treaty is also what happens between Ali and Muawiyah. Uh, mm. This is also a very, very watershed moment around, around leadership, which then leads to the, the formation of the Khawarij, right? the very first breakaway movement within, uh, within Islamic history that is... Uh, uh, attuned to the deployment of violence for political aims, and you know the tendencies of this uh, uh, come to to this day. Sure. Now, so, so Hassan assigns a, a peace treaty with Muawiyah with this uh, insistence, with this key element mm -hmm. that Muawiyah does not make leadership into something hereditary. That after his death, right, um, leadership passes on to. Hassan. Okay. And the other thing that has to be kept in mind uh, with with Islamic history and in, in particular this period is Arab tribalism, the the various tribes, the various groups, oh, yeah. and and the the animosities and hatreds both prior to the advent of Islam, but during Islam as well. And there is a unique kind of animosity towards. Ali being the kind of warrior that he was, right? The flag bearer, the 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 Fatah of Khaybar, you know, the, the, with all of the history throughout Islamic Islamic uh, understandings of history, no other warrior has had the status of, of Ali, right? The the, the Dhulfiqar and, and so forth. 
Um, what happens though, so Muawiyah agrees, and this is clear in, in Islamic history, some of the earliest works such as Tabari and, and, his, and his history and so forth. And Muawiyah assassinates, uh, assassinates Hassan. And there's two uh, uh, possibilities of how Hassan was, uh, what, with, with what means he yeah. was assassinated. Poison. But the uh, correct. Yeah. But the, the, and, or the other one was that there was some type of like ointment or something that was, that yeah. was utilized. But essentially, he was assassinated and the, and the assassination was ordered by Muawiyah. Okay. And Muawiyah then gives leadership to his son, Yazid. Right. Now, Muawiyah ha he was a writer of wahya he was a, he was a scribe and uh you know again the the, the shi'i interpretation and definition of of what a sahaba of the prophet is varies with the the sunni uh, interpretation i see within the sunni tradition correct it's usually that someone spent time with the prophet or even if they had seen the prophet with their eyes they're counted as a sahabi that's correct? right within the shi'i tradition the Sahabi of the Prophet are people who spent time with the Prophet. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, then there is a classification with respect to the qualitative state of the Sahaba of the Prophet. The Shi'is do not have a view that all of the companions of the Prophet were of the same spiritual ethical standing. Okay. Right um, within the Sunni tradition, for as a contrast, you know the very famous hadith that all of my companions are like the stars, which are whichever one of them you follow, you will be you will be guided and so forth. Mm -hmm. No such thing exists within the the Shi'i tradition. So Shi'is have uh, what they would consider to be a, a more uh, analytical look and scrutinization of the Sahabi, both when they were with the Prophet. And then after the passing of the prophet, uh, and they would say that we clearly see issues and we clearly see shifts and 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 transitions that happen. Sure. Uh, and as we know, there was also an attempt at the life of the prophet during his. I mean, these are aspects of Islamic history. But at the very same time, Muawiyah, at the very least, attempted to sustain and maintain uh, the performance of Islam. Uh, uh, Shi'is would say there was prayer. Although he had utilized uh, the pulpit to antagonize people against the household of the Prophet, particularly Ali and, and, and so forth. But Yazid, on the other hand, was very much recognized as an individual who was very openly antagonistic to Islam. Um, there was, of course, uh, you know, history books talk about this. There was fornication and womanization there was the gambling there was uh, alcohol the alcohol uh, all of these the you know what we would from within an Islamic ethical lens look as things that are completely haram or, or promiscuity debauchery and, and so forth so the fact that he is then granted the seat of power right and the caliph as much as uh, you know within the, 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 the normative Sunni tradition is understood to be a political leader, not so much a spiritual leader, but that spiritual component gets cooked into it, yeah. right? It gets absorbed, so you don't really uh, separate the, the spirituality sure. from, the, from the political, although openly it's not considered. I mean, even in the, in the Hanafi tradition, as, as you know, the Friday prayers uh, are supposed to take place with the presence of a just caliph, right. um, you know. Um, so with Yazid being in power, there's then the the request or the demand rather of bay'ah of allegiance to him and some people are are bought you know there's a there's a tremendous amount of wealth that has then entered by this time into the muslim lands so there is the, an increase in islam in the islamic lands of material possessions and materialism within the court during the court of Muawiyah and the court of yazid mm -hmm. of court of the the ashraf and and the people of of high standing uh, and there we see to see a desensitization to these things within uh, within the wider Islamic community. Yes. I want to ask a question because this is sort of the second time you've brought this up. Uh, earlier it was in the context of expansion. Yes. Because generally speaking, the Sunni reading of Muslim history vis-a-vis -vis expansion and empire is a positive reading mm -hmm. of it, as almost like a validation of God's favor, et cetera, sure. et cetera. Is there a difference among like a Shia reading of the same history? Is expansion seen as, as excess? Uh, is material uh, wealth seen as being exce like excessive during th this early period? 
Yes. Okay. The, the short answer is yes. That the the attraction towards materialism mm. is is a fundamental issue that um, alters the path of Islam, the okay. Islamic ethical and, and spiritual uh, sure. process. And with respect to expansionism, the expansionism becomes a worldly pursuit, not a spiritual pursuit. Okay. Um, especially when we look at instances in which this, you know, the term of, of Ghazi, which becomes very, very prominent. And when we look through our Islamic kind of history and even modern histories of countries, that it was used as a way to Kind of attain wealth and, and booty and sometimes um you know very obscene acts and and violence committed towards towards women uh and and other things mm. uh that from an ethical religious perspective are problematic mm. so from the shi'i readings it is that the the spread of islam is most effective through the example of the, the the philosophical, the spiritual, the the divine cosmology and the content of Islam, not through force and, and what we would refer to as tahmil and like the, right. enforcing it through that. And you know, when we look at Islamic history as well, the the way that Islam enters into the subcontinent, for example, sure. the way that Islam reaches Malaysia and Indonesia, the way that Islam reaches China and, and other places, even though uh, you know I, earlier I had mentioned what is now Afghanistan. The land of, of, of Khorasan and Kabbalistan, and there is of course war, mm -hmm. but the the people uh, there is a political victory that happens, and then there is a spiritual victory that happens, and that spiritual victory always happens through the Islamic ethical process, right? Sure. The, the the wisdom of the Prophet, the akhlaq, the tawhid, tasawwuf, of course, plays an important part in it, uh, and so forth. So the fact that now this seat of power <clears throat> is in the hands of an individual like Yazid is deeply problematic right. uh, from this reading. And so Hassan has been martyred; he's been assassinated. Right poisoned and Hussein is the last surviving uh, grandson of the prophet as he's referred to right and uh, we were talking earlier about yeah go ahead you no, I was just gonna say like we, we were joking off Mike about being a car like me being a card carrying Sunni uh, I'm gonna get my card revoked if I don't say <laughs> just for the sake of just, just for sure, the record sure. that I think the Sunni reading they would dispute the idea that Muawiyah poisoned or assassinated Hassan. As an academic, would you concede that point? No, no, I wouldn't. Okay, okay. Because, because okay. in That's Sunnis, fair. Uh, and, and the reason why I say that is because there are sufficient Sunni sources. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I mentioned Tabari, for example, Baghdadi, okay. others who. I identified the role that Muawiyah played in this. I mean, I for see. example, Tabari being one of the earliest and most prominent of thinkers. And as you know, at one point he had his, his own madhab he's, that doesn't- He's right there behind you. Yeah, sorry. When, when it comes to tafsir, when it comes to history, mm -hmm. uh, but he also had his own madhab, right? That, that didn't survive. He's identifying the, the, the role that Muawiyah has, very distinctly saying that he's responsible for the assassination of, of, of Hassan. Okay. So of course there is then, a, a later rehabilitation that has to happen. It's, and this is uh, the case for yeah. many instances. I mean, we can talk about within the Shi'i tradition as well, there is rehabilitation that happens when it comes to, you know, some figures within the Safavid time, right? I was uh, just so, about to ask, like, because we were talking about expansionism, you know, what about during the Fatimids? What about during the Safavids? So, like, are we applying the same standards of like looking at material expansion as being generally problematic? Uh, I, I think, I think yeah. if we're honest, right, yeah. as, as Muslims. We should. And and as yeah. you know, as as ethical human beings, sure. yeah, we have to look at what kinds of destruction this caused mm -hmm. right? at, at local levels, at, at regional sure. levels, and uh, and so forth. So, uh, um, anyway, so just like suffice to say. People should, you know, like read history yes. and, and, and come to <laughs> and that. And not yeah. selectively. Sure. Read, read competing histories and Thank come you. to, come yeah. to uh, yeah, sure. a conclusion. Fair enough. So um, let's come back to the, yeah. So Hassan uh, and is assassinated. Hussein is surviving. And and I think earlier we were talking about, off, I think off topic, yeah. uh, off mic, off mic. Uh, about, well, the Prophet had other grandchildren. Yeah. Like there was Zainab, there's others. Why did they also have the same kind of standing? And it seems that within Islamic history and within the sayings and words of the Prophet, uh, you know, for example, Zainab is not included in the Ayah of Tathir. Um, she doesn't have Isma, mm -hmm. although she has this, this tremendous excellence. And I think as we get a little bit deeper into the events in and post uh, Ashura, Ashura mm -hmm. you'll see the prominence and the, the the excellence of Zainab, the respect and reverence towards her. But uh, the Prophet, for example, you know, says, 
uh, the, the sense of heaven comes from uh, Hassan, uh, the Hussein uh, uh, Safina to Naja, right? He is this 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 ship uh, and this. Uh, this the safety this bastion of safety uh of of salvation, salvation. right that is, is captured in in, in sunni hadith but the same things aren't said about zainab aren't said about the, these others so the pressure on hussein is now that he needs to give allegiance to uh the yazid yeah. and also uh, ibn zubayr another prominent uh member and and leader in this in this region and uh, at this point uh you know hussein is in medina He's forced to go to Mecca, uh, and w and while he's in Mecca, the the Kufans and Kufa during the the Khilafat of uh, of Hazrat Ali alayhi salam becomes the capital of, of Islam. This gets changed, right? It gets gets moved there. I was just there. about to say, yeah. Um, and there's a there's a strong presence of what are referred to as the Shiites of Ali, right? The 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 uh, the supporters uh, and and those who kind of lobby for the presence of of the excellence of, of Ali and the Ahlul by, by extension, mm -hmm. they begin to write letters to Hussein saying that, you know, this what's what's unfolding is a tremendous thing. Why don't you lead us? We will support you. And uh, and these letters essentially come by the hundreds. Um, and uh, Hussein sends his cousin, uh, Muslim uh, uh, bin Aqil, to go to Kufa and to see, are the people actually going to support him? Or can they put up a resistance against what is seen as unjust and un Islamic and oppressive and a breach of the treaty that was signed, right? So there's multiple kind of layers, layers. Uh, in, mm. involved in it. And at the same time, there is an attempt uh, made to assassinate uh, Hussein while he is in while he is in Mecca, um, uh, and especially during the time of the pilgrimage, uh, so he essentially makes his way to uh, to Medina from Medina with the companions and the family of the Prophet. There, the aim is to go to. Uh, at this point, they've received a letter to go to Kufa. Kufa. The people in, in Kufa are ready to to support him. Yeah. Muslim Naqil is in Kufa, uh, essentially. Let's just summarize this history. Uh, he is killed uh, in a tremendously brutal way. He he is martyred. Uh, the people of Kufa are threatened with death uh, if they support uh, Ali, and uh, excuse me, right. if they support Hussein. Hussein. And while this is happening, and, and Muslim bin Aqil had previously sent the letter to Imam Al Hussein saying that yes, these people are going to support you. They've given bay'ah and allegiance. As they're coming from uh, on their route to Kufa. The governor of Kufa extends a force to block them and to prevent them from coming in and reaching Kufa. This is then the the unfolding of how they eventually make are forced to Karbala. Mm -hmm. Karbala, the very term, the very name Karb and Bala, right? This this compound refers to a deep pain and a deep grief and a tremendous tribulation, right? Uh, there is, of course, uh, a, a particular uh, literature around the prophet identifying that Hussein will be martyred. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very important part for the way that Shi'is understand the cosmology and, and how cosmic and momentous the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein is. This is not simply... A historical occurrence, the, something that is unfavorable that happened to the household of the Prophet, mm -hmm. but it is so prominent. It's a watershed moment that, uh, from the Shi'i reading of history and 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 perspective, it sustained Islam from being completely deviated and shifted towards an entirely different okay. uh, direction. So, sure. so conceding the point, like yes. going back to. Um, Conceding that Imam Hassan is also martyred and, yes. and killed, uh, assassinated, what is the difference between the two martyrdoms uh, within Shi'i thought? Make that distinction for sure. us, because you've you've mentioned. I mean, the the what ha the events of Karbala and the uh, um, you know the martyrdom of Imam Hussein is a watershed moment, but you didn't say the same about Imam Hassan. Right. So, and I know that's not by accident. So if you could make that sort of distinction from a Shi'i perspective. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the one of the very uh, initial distinctions is that the, the assassination of Imam Ali, the assassination of Imam Hassan, 
are assassinations of one individual, even though they're the imams, even though they're ma'asum, but it's one individual. Okay. Um, the 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 martyrdom and the assassination of Imam al Hussein is not just him. Right. It's also the family, his children, mm-hmm. um, his companions, uh, supporters, and others. And it's done in the most gruesome and brutal of ways, which Shi'is uh, mention as both uh, signifying and illustrating the evil of the other side, that it's not being done just against anyone, but that it's being done against the grandson of the prophet who is not unknown to people. His status and his excellence, they would say, was known to everyone, uh, you know, uh, historically, the, the assumption is that he, the, the view rather, I should say, is that uh, Imam al Hussein is born either in the third or fourth year after Hijrah. From that point onward, I mean, everybody knew who he is, yeah. who, his, who he is, who his father is, who his mother is, who his brothers are. This is not an unknown individual that they're like, oh, well, you are a rebel. Yeah. But that this is being done to someone that represents the prophet. Mm -hmm. And they will all oftentimes refer to a very prominent narration that also exists in the Sunni tradition, which is uh, Rasulullah, it would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam, Husaynu minni wa ana min Husayn. Husayn is of me, which is a very, let's just be honest, it's a very clear, expected thing to say. Of course, he's the grandson of the prophet. But the latter part is one that is a bit more um, requiring of pause. Mm Wa min Hussein, and I am of Hussein. They would say, "Well, it's impossible for a grandfather uh, to be of the grandson. It, that's not a backwards kind of um, yeah. uh, relation. It's a forward relation that goes in." Yeah. So they say that this points to uh, an essential thing, an essentially spiritual excellence that they are from the same source. They are from the same nur, right? Um, so the the martyrdom, the 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 killing of Imam al Hussein is also an attempt, in other ways, of the destruction of Islam. Mm. That's why it becomes such a watershed moment. And of course, also with respect to who was at the helm of power at this point, Yazid, who very openly uh, described his animosity towards Islam. The fact that, uh, as we will see, when the severed head of the grandson of the Prophet, Imam al Hussein, is brought to the court of of Yazid, Yazid celebrates it. Yazid uh, recites poetry, and it is noted that he was actually very uh, uh, competent in Arabic poetry, very skilled in Arabic poetry. Uh, but he recites poetry celebrating the the death, mocking the family of the Prophet, mocking the uh, the granddaughter of the Prophet Zainab, the, the great-grandson of the Prophet Zainul Abidin, who's referred to as Sajjad, the other household members of the household of the Prophet, who are marched as captives um, throughout various Muslim cities, through Kufa, through brought to Sham and Damascus, right? How are they marched? They are marched with chains around them. The the headscarves of the household of the Prophet is removed. And there's all these various acts of violence and humiliation or attempts of humiliation that are unfolded against the household of the Prophet. And for, for from the Shi'i perspective, this is a clear indication of a deep rot within Islamic society, right? So the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein takes place 50 years after the passing of the Prophet. How, what happened in Islamic society that in those five decades allowed for people who openly claim, you know, that we're Muslim, such as the people who were, uh, um, uh, who marched uh, in Karbala and who uh, set, you know, the the rows uh, against the 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 companions of the Imam and the Imam himself, and the numbers of martyrs usually ranges between 70 to, 72 to uh, a bit under one hundred and thirty five. Mm-hmm. So this this number usually seventy two is the most common number that is that is that is utilized in reference. Yeah. How is it that uh, an between 30 to 40,000 on the other side. That's the, the range of the numbers that happen, which included Hufaz of the Quran, directed their swords and directed their spears against Imam al Hussein, right? So uh, when Hussein is forced to camp in, in Karbala because he's prevented from Kufa, he's also prevented from going elsewhere. He's prevented from going to Medina. They say, no, we've been told that we have to bring you back. 
you have to pay allegiance and we're mm. going to take you uh, take you in. And what unfolds, uh, so this is in the month of Muharram, yeah. right? The, and the second of Muharram is when they reach Karbala in which they're forced to uh, essentially set up their tents, set up uh, the uh, their, their last yeah. presence there. Sure. And throughout all of this, uh, so from the second of Karbala to the fifth of Karbala, there is access to water. Muharram. Uh, excuse Sorry. me, of, of Muharram, thank uh -huh. you. Yeah. Uh, there's access to water. And then access to water is denied for them. They spend three days essentially up until Ashura without access to water. Uh, the thirst uh, is is another important, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in, in a bit. There are certain yeah. symbolisms that, right. that uh, Ashura and Karbala really represent. Um, one of the in Shi in, in Shi life in Shi which is life a ritual life in, in Shi yeah. life and I would argue also yeah. within the broader Islamic uh, conceptualizations and reception oh. of this, um, 100%. which uh, in, primarily within the Sufi tradition and within the poetic tradition. Very so nice. we have, for example, you know, if we're talking about recent instances, Allama Iqbal has very prominent uh, lines of poetry associating the sustenance and the survival of Islam with the shahada of yeah. uh, Imam al-Hussein. If right. you look at all of the historic giants of the uh, of the Persianate tradition, mm -hmm. so if you look at individuals like uh, Sa'di mm -hmm. of Shiraz, if you look at Hafiz, uh, if you look at Mawlana Jalaluddin al-Balkhi, Rumi, Rumi. Uh, if you look at Nasr al-Khusrau, of course, if you look at Beydel, uh, all of these giants, Mirza Ghalib, all of these giants, there's always the recognition of the brutality and oppression against uh, Imam al Hussein, the household of the Prophet, but also the excellence of their stand, That's the, right. their, their, their That's sacrifice, right. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Karbala, now, the, the Imam spends the next number of days attempting to bring the hujjat, bring the dalail, bring the proofs as to uh, making it clear that these individuals are intent on shedding the blood of the grandson of the prophet, right? That uh, in multiple uh, instances, he makes clear that I have not risen for political power, right? Uh, desiring to be a rebel, but I have risen in order to bid what is right and forbid what is wrong. Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, right? And he says, in order to rehabilitate and correct the ummah of my grandfather Muhammad mm -hmm. and his religion. This becomes the the clear um, insistence uh, from the Shi'i perspective as to the uprising of the Imam, yeah. the preservation and protection of the ummah of the Prophet from deviation, right? The the bidding of that which is right, the forbidding of that which is which is wrong, and the clear interpretive lens of how Islam should be understood. Uh, and it becomes clear as he's giving these these uh, these talks and these sermons to these various leaders and 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 uh, and, and regular soldiers and and others that these individuals are essentially set on killing them. Uh, it's it's an it's an arena of political violence, but it's also an arena of the utilization of the symbolism of religion for the sake of violence, right? In a way that it betrays the very formative figure of that of that religion mm. now for shi'is both the events prior to karbala and the events during these days of karbala reach a climax on the 10th ashura why because it is on the 10th that the vast majority of the shohada of the martyrs of karbala and imam al hussein are martyred. It's on the 10th. So the day of Ashura becomes very much tied to this mourning, right? And this mourning is both a mourning at the betrayal of others. This is important. That it is a mourning as to how could it be that the Ummah of the Prophet betrayed their Prophet. It's seen as a betrayal of the Prophet, not just wronging his grandson, very much connected to, and the betrayal of the Prophet is seen as a betrayal of the Quran and of, of this religion. So it's not simply mourning a historical occurrence, a moment in history, but uh, and, and that betrayal, but also this desire and this longing to have been with the Imam, 
mm. to have been there to support him, um, to have been one of those individuals when so many others abandon him to support him. Yeah, And then it takes another component. This is very, very important, is how can the reasonings, the ideals, the sayings of the imam. For example, the imam says, "Anas abidu dunya." People be in 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 Karbala that people are slaves to this world. What dino laqun ala al sinatihim? And religion is simply just a brief thing on their tongues. If something is to their benefit, though they will say that we are religious. But the moment that something tries and something makes them uncomfortable or discomforts them, they abandon religion. Uh, and he talks about, for example, that it is impossible for someone like me, meaning Hussein, as a representative to give bay'ah, to give allegiance to someone like Yazid, who is an oppressor. They talk about his sayings that uh, never to humiliation, hayhat min al hayhat to this humiliation of not having choice, of not having freedom, of not having the honor and the integrity of making your own decision, of having freedom of movement, right? Of being forced to give allegiance to someone. So for the Shi'i perspective, Kar Karbala and Ashura are this cosmic event, right. right? It's this cosmic event that has relevance to every day, every period, because there's always this battle, mm. there's always this conflict between sharr and khair, between evil, between dhulam and, and oppression, mm -hmm. and the religious complication and the religious call towards living as ahrar, of, of people who are free, of people who worship God, of people who have the karama that God has given you. And so there's there's this, this important call that is usually repeated during these days and outside of it is that kulla arad in Karbala. Every place. Every place, every land is Karbala. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, growing up, you know, I grew up in these kinds of majalis, as they say. Mm -hmm. The majalis... Um, uh, and we'll talk about it in, in a way. I feel like we have like ninety minute uh, hours to talk about things. Like, well, like, I no. Keep what I was going to say, I think what would be good is to finish the historical part of sure. it. Okay. And and at some point, we're going to have to stop the historical conversation. And I, I think you know best when to do so. Sure. And then from there, we can get into the symbolic, uh, venerative practices that are associated with. Karbala sure. and uh, Muharram, specific, obviously within the Shi'i, um, you know, okay, perspective. Excellent. That, that, that right? makes sense. Yeah. So um, there are particular words of the Imam that very much are pronounced and prominent. Okay. Um, such as this indication, this call towards freedom. Okay. This call towards justice. Uh, again, the islah of the of the ummah of the Prophet, the idea of Amr bil Ma'roof, Nahi an al Munkar, of uh, supreme. It's also seen as a tremendously esoteric field of this of individuals who have no fear, mm -hmm. individuals who are willing to give everything. You can never attain this excellence. Uh, unless and except you give of that which you love, mm -hmm. right? What is greater than our own selves or loved ones, right? Not just mon monetary things, etc. And they point to the fact that uh, Karbala, again, what happens then on the ninth, it's clear that the household of the Prophet is going to be killed. That Imam Al Hussein asks his brother. Abbas to go and to request uh, reprieve for a night so that they can spend it in prayer and in worship. His cousin or brother? His brother. Okay. Abbas, yes. Okay. Younger brother. Who comes from a different wife after being ah, a Fatima. That's right. That's uh, right. Uh, yeah. uh, passes. passes. There's Umm al Banin, uh, whose name was also Fatima, but you know, within the, the, the Shi'i historio right. historiography, because of the veneration and respect that she had for Fatima, she asked Imam Ali to refer to to not refer to her by her by her first name. Mm -hmm. So Abbas is also a very f uh, important figure in, in in Karbala because of his bravery. He's a connection to to Ali, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have Isma. He's not Masum. The the Isma, the Masumiya that we talk about, the infallibility is awesome. with 
Fatima, maybe Fatima, Fatima and, line. And, and, and others. Right. So he goes and he asks them for for this reprieve, for this this period that they can spend in, in devotion. So by the ninth nine night now, mm -hmm. there is an anticipatory thing that's building up. There is an emotional, there's a spiritual, there's a historical, there is a philosophical uh, journey that has been unpacking and that has been expanding for the audience, right? At, as, as it's happening. And of course, for the, uh, during that time with everything that is, that is going on and something very interesting and profound happens on this night nine, in addition to the historical record that everyone who were there in these tents are busy in prayer and in supplication and the recitation of the Quran, the Imam gathers all of the people who are there. So let's say you take that number between 72 to mm. a bit, say 134 or, or under. And he extinguishes the candle, he extinguishes the lights that are there and says that any one of you who wants to leave, leave in the darkness of the night. These people have the intention and the aim of killing me. I remove my 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 right and my bayah. Your bayah is is free. You can go if you want. Mm -hmm. And this is a very if if we can pause for just a brief moment. It's a very interesting uh, discussion around the political aims and the political philosophy around affirmation around voting around choice around freedom in islam hmm. yeah you see where it's not that you gave me bayah and it's not that you know you have to be with me until the very end yeah like binding of and this binding right. but but there's this ex there's this karama right mm. there's this there's this excellent there's this ihsan that you can go not only can you go but i'm turning off the light as from within this tradition that you save face Right, that and that there's a very profound thing mm. that that for for Shi'is is get, gets repeated year yeah. in and, and year out about the grace of the Imam, okay. about the gentleness of the, the care of the Imam, the tenderness of the Imam, and then the the narrations will mention that none of the companions leave. So so the companions, and they vary from various ages, right, right? to the very old, Habib ibn Mazahir, an old man, a Sheikh, to the very young. A twelve-year-old boy, right? In that they their loyalty to the Imam, their loyalty to the prophetic path, their loyalty to, to this religion overtakes anything else, hmm. any other care, right? Um, so that's how the ninth nine night is spent. And then the tenth, the Ashur, Ashura, one by one, the companions of the Imam, the household of the Prophet, the Hashemites they engage in battle. And the way that the story is retold and commemorated is that each of these nights, right, and in, in, in popular performance yeah. and, and, and the, the morning, each of the nights are associated with someone from, from Karbala. I see. So the ninth is associated with someone. The eighth is associated with someone. The seventh is associated with someone, etc. I see. And then the tenth is, of course, Ashura, which is mainly the remembrance of the martyrdom of, of Imam al Hussein. And then there's Shama Gariban. Usually it's referred to as the night in which the household of the Prophet are made, they are enslaved. They are arrested, they are tortured, mm -hmm. right? All of these things happen. Uh, on Ashura... Um, That's the aftermath. The, the, the after, yeah. the, the, the very, uh, right after the, the right. martyrdom Correct. of, of Imam, the Imam night al of, if you the will, night, right? Yes, exactly, right. the night the night of. Yeah. With the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein, mm -hmm. uh, there is the recounting, not only of their bravery, not only of their chivalry, not only of how they fought, Right after seeing and witnessing their loved ones martyred, the youngest to the oldest, the the, mm -hmm. the history talks about how the Imam brought his youngest child, Ali Asghar, who was six months old at that time, and held him up and said, "If you're denying us water, then offer water at least to this child." And a Harmala directs a three-pronged arrow to be shot at his neck. So the Imam, they say that whole has his child, this innocent masum child, with 
who's now martyred, mm -hmm. six month old child, right? And there's all these visuals around how various ways of violence, various ways of betrayal, various ways of oppression are being uh, 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 are being uh, done upon the yeah. Um, exacted upon this the small family of the, yeah, prophet, the family right of right. the family of the prophet so until from, yes mm -hmm. go ahead. from a from an like from a historical record perspective right um why like wh how is it that we come to know so much detail right right, right. as opposed to for example badr or uh, khandaq or right there's a lot and so like because i know for example at least from a sunni perspective we don't have that level of detail when it comes to Uhud or Badr. I mean, generally these things are spoken of in kind of broad strokes. So I, I'm, I'm asking that as a sort of, yeah. Oh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Mm -hmm. And it actually, it ties very nicely mm. to why the Majalis matter. Okay. Uh, which is that the reason why we know so much is that there are survivors to Karbala. And the survivors, uh, the two prominent survivors of Karbala are Zainab of course. and Zain al Abidin, yeah. the son of the of Imam al Hussein. Now, how did Zain al Abidin survive when the other sons of the Imam, nephews of the Imam, we have sons of Imam al Hassan who were martyred. Bibi Zainab uh, has two sons who were martyred. That's you know, right. all of these uh, other things, is because he was so sick mm -hmm. that they thought he would die, and they that he could not fight. Uh, he, he was essentially on the verge of death. So there's this entire very interesting unfolding of how they consider him essentially dead. There's no reason to draw out your sword and, and, and kill him because they do loot the, the tents of the, the household of the prophet. They do steal. They, they burn them. There's this violence that is enacted on the women and, and of the children of the household of the prophet. And then as I no, noted, they are imprisoned and captured and paraded through Muslim lands from Kufa to, uh, to Sham and, and, and other areas with stops being made there and people you know sh celebrating and, and saying takbir as they are there. The severed heads of the martyrs of Karbala, including the, the sacred head head of Imam al Hussein uh, alayhi salam is placed on spears and and they're uh, you know kind of paraded around but when they finally reach the court of Yazid there is a verbal confrontation there's a there's a uh, there's a rhetorical battle that happens in this rhetorical battle the voice of Zainab appears as a storyteller of an eloquent orator as a uh, preserver of the prophetic line of reasoning about the injustices that have been done and about the excellence of the household of the prophet and of the prophet. Because in this exchange, and these are, of course, captured in, in, his, in the historical record, okay. is that um, Yazid is celebrating that you have been humiliated and you have been destroyed and you have been uh, uh, kind of, you know, defeated. And uh, Zainab's words and then Zainul Abidin's words are essentially no, that you think that God uh, does not test his servants. You think that a worldly reprieve that you have for a few days means victory. You think that the religion of God and the religion of the prophet have been have ended but it actually has been preserved uh, you think that you will not be held accountable right mm. and all, all of these these various things and then um she says a very very important uh, line she, when she was asked how did you see what what happened imagine the trauma the violence the brutality uh she says Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. i did not see anything but beauty and this is a very, very prominent theme for the Shi'is. As much as they mourn, mm -hmm. they also emphasize the spiritual beauty and excellence that was that was there in in, in Karbala. Yeah. And then um, through this, the 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 circle of Bibi Zainab and then of, of Imam Zainul Abidin, there there are actual gatherings and recitation of poetry and other things in which. This story and this narrative is both circulated, and then you have historians who then absorb it and, okay. and write it. Abu Mikhnab, okay. Tabari, and, and, and others who, who have. So there is a a, a very uh, solidified and strong yeah. historical record for it. Right. In addition to also, there's a literature of of myth that's there as well. Yeah. But the historical record is is definitely I there. See. This becomes an event right away. People are mourning 
how are the people in power not how do they tend how do they stay onto that power if maybe you could say the masses or a good chunk of society sees this as a wrong mm. how how yeah. how does that how, how does that jive with the fact that they we're st still held on to power. Oh yeah, that, that's that's excellent. So one thing to to mention is that a large number of individuals, again, they were celebrating this. It was it was seen as a political victory. That's that desensitization had happened. Right. The historical record talks about how people were, you know, yelling takbir and celebrating uh, and giving things in charity. Some were even fasting as a result as a result mm. of this. It is then after I mentioned that rhetorical presence, that oratory, mm. that, that language, that, uh, that connectedness to the preservation of what the inner and outer meanings of this uprising were yeah. of the Imam, that then there is a change, a shift that happens, right? So Yazid eventually, uh, and at one point he wants to kill Zainal Abedin um, and then Zainab and others get involved in saying, oh, if you're going to kill him, also kill us. And, you know, they, people say, okay, we'll just let them go there. Nothing's going to happen. But uh, there is then a, a recognizing and a recognition of the fact that something wrong had happened. So there is this, this tawabin, there is this uh, attempt to kind of make amends to this. Mm. We also see a number of uprisings that, that, mm. that happened uh, later on. Uh, um, we know that later on in, in, the, in the rule of, uh, of Yazid, uh, for example, the fight against uh, uh, Ibn Zubayr, happens wherein both Medina, both Medina and Mecca uh, are attacked. Uh, for example, many Muslims may not have heard about this, but the, the fighting is so intense that Yazid's for, uh, fi forces even harm the Kaaba. The Kaaba catches on fire. Uh, I mean, these are historical uh, records, right? Uh, so it does lead then to a number of uprisings, mm -hmm. a number of movements right. to avenge the, the 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 killing of the the grandson of the prophet. Right. So it shifts happens, yeah. but it takes time. Right. It takes because time. It, it, I think to Umar's point, it, it sort of paints in broad strokes not only the rulers or the actual uh, perpetrators of this heinous act, but sort of the masses almost right. as being celebratory, as you said. And I'm not denying that that may have that may not have occurred or that did occur like i would admit you know you would also imagine like people saying wait this is wrong and this is evil and uh you know the this is the family of the prophet i mean right. there has to be right i mean again if i think if we're only being fair in terms of even analysis uh i think you would you would you know one one can see that to deny that there was either people who were celebrating it would be equally unjust or but to also deny that people were lamenting it and and you know even rebelling against the against the ruler yeah and that also, happens yeah. that happens with like you could think of Amer the american right. politics right yeah. you have people who are caught up in the propaganda or whatever and they yeah. think that sure. this is the right thing to do sure oh uh, yeah. history proves them wrong and then there's right. people who are on the right side of history uh, right so there's always that uh, split, you could say. Of course, mm. and 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 the other thing is where this happened. So it's not mm. that the takbirs were happening in Medina or Mecca. Uh, sure. Takbirs were happening as they are being paraded in in Kufa, mm. which was already under the threat, uh, or Sham, which had a very different perception okay. of uh, Ali and the household of the Prophet than other areas. So this is also important because the Good geographical point. presence plays an impact. Uh, and the other thing that is important to note is that when individuals were usually paraded, uh -huh. the assumption was that these were non-Muslims or these were deviants or these were something along those lines. The anticipation that it's being done to the household of the Prophet yeah. or that everybody would recognize what the household of the Prophet looks like is also not there. Mm. So we have That's in the point. historical record where people, again, you know, just to kind of imagine that the, the veils, and we can all understand the prominence of the veil in the Muslim imagination today and especially during Arabia of that time, how prominent uh, it, it would be. It was seen as a both a protective thing, a spiritual thing, but also a, a symbolism of a certain status, Correct. right? And to have the household, the woman of the household of the Prophet unveiled, chained, uh, forced to walk, right? Uh, hit with whips, these are extreme things, right? So there are instances in which people ask, who are you? Mm, yeah. 
who are you as they are being paraded and someone says that this is i'm zainab i'm the granddaughter of the prophet and someone then brings um a, a scarf or someone brings give them some clothing so there was this unawareness that's happening there but again uh, that's not to say that the celebration happened everywhere. Yeah. We're, we're talking about a particular kind of route that is that is being taken, but areas in which there was, you know, a strong yeah. Umayyad uh, presence yeah. and 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 funding. Yeah, the perception is very much different. Yes, I have to ask. Um, I just recently uh, visited Cairo. Al Hussein significantly, or or specifically, I'm referring to the shrine in Cairo which uh, claims to be where the head of the uh, of Imam Hussein is. I think historically speaking, that is probably not the case, correct? Um, so the, there, what happens, let me just briefly say that yeah. the companions of the Imam and the Imam himself are dismembered, are I mean, dismembered should, yeah. in the very worst of ways. So when, yeah. when, when Shi'is recall this event, mm -hmm. they usually go into very vivid detail as to what happens to Imam al Hussein, mm -hmm. in addition to the multiple wounds that he receives and the severing of his member uh, of his of his limbs, he is beheaded. And then his body is stripped of clothing. And he is left in in that field, and then horses are uh, ridden across his blessed body. So now, you know, let me just pause for a second. We are living in a genocide right now. We are witnessing the genocide of the Palestinian people, and you see the visuals of the beheaded babies, the severed limbs, the uh, the Palestinians who have been run over by tanks and by other things. It it pierces your mind it 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 haunts you mm -hmm. right and and for the for shi'is this remembrance is a very haunting thing because again we mourn what's happening to the palestinians and any other innocent individual but the status of the imam is something that's different right and yes so then the bodies are taken and and paraded uh, around um there is there's historical views that say that the head is brought back to karbala um, and there's burials that take place uh, by by the Banu Asad, uh, okay. and Imam Zain al-Abidin also comes back. There are others that say no, actually the head continued going elsewhere, uh, but the body is is in is in Karbala. Um, so there is, I mean, from the historical, there is a possibility that that it is the the head of Imam al Hussein salam alayhi, or that it could be uh, again both united in 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 Karbala. Right. Uh, Generally speaking, though, where the Shi'is yeah. Shi generally speaking consider the the head and the body to be in Karbala. Karbala. Hence, that's the sort of locus of pilgrimage. That's that's the locus yeah. of pilgrimage, yeah, right? Yeah. As uh, opposed to Al Hussein in Cairo, right, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, but but the histo but the historical scholarship uh -huh. does give space to to that. But okay. the general public kind of perception usually says that mm. it's all there yeah. in in Karbala. Now, also Bibi Nafisa is buried in Cairo. Now, she is the daughter of. Zain Zainab, um, is she is she alive during these events? I mean, historically speaking, okay, right, so she right. is. So, so the events of Karbala also, um, or she plays a role in that in terms of the veneration and uh, the all commemoration. The, correct. Okay. All of the all of the figures, uh -huh. right? All of the figures who are involved in in Karbala have a prominence both those who were martyred uh -huh. and those who were survivors so the 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 commemoration and then the venerations that happen like the shrine of of say the zainab and 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 syria is a is a site of visitation it's yeah. a site of of pilgrimage right of the other imams of the other companions of of mm -hmm. you know the famous story of hur uh who's who changes sides uh mm -hmm. from the from the army of of uh, of ibn Ziyad to the side of imam al hussein salam allah alayhi. there's all these different sure, individuals sure. but yes they their commemoration and their respect is is there but the chief uh space mm. uh, of pilgrimage in relation to karbala uh is for imam al Hussein and then abbas abul fadl abbas and where where That's is also he buried? In karbala. it's also in, in karbala. karbala okay yes. okay i would be remiss if i didn't ask also about ashura and not its significance uh, well i mean yeah we we could say significance but the way it's commemorated in the sunni world mm -hmm. So it is tied, yes, to the events of, of, of what happened historically to Imam al-Hussein, but it's also tied to fasting 
and to Musa Ali right. and the Exodus. What is the Shi'i perspective about that? Right. right. Um, you have two approaches. Okay. Because the Sunnis argue that this was something that the Prophet observed in Medina, and then he instructed his followers to fast. Right. That's generally the Sunni approach. And the Sunni perspective, hence why, you know, a lot of people will generally consider fasting on the 10th of Muharram to right. be a laudable act. Right, right. right. Expiates sort of the sins yeah, of one year right, and, and right, all, of, all right. of these things. And then the Prophet also having said that in order to be different than the Jews, that you add a day, either the 11th or the 9th. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Sure. So within, within the Shi'i tradition, there are two uh, interpretations around this. One interpretation consider this, uh, considers this to be a, a weak hadith okay. and considers it to not be uh, reputable in the way of it's, it's uh, it doesn't hold up to analysis. Okay. Uh, sure. And they would they would argue that the prophet would not emulate this, and that when you look at the historical record or historical calendar, it's impossible for that to happen. And they'll point out to the modern day uh, occurrence of this, and they'll say, well, there's not really anything that would uh, be equivalent to Ashura that the Jews uh, celebrate or they or they hold a fast for. Yeah. Um, that's one view. Okay. The other view is that yes, the Prophet did talk about fasting and that uh, fasting is possible, it's viable, but fasting does not uh, overwhelm or overtake the significance of the martyrdom of Imam sure. al-Hussein, salam um, so, so would Shi'is fast on that day? Or generally generally speaking, Shi'is no. do not fast okay. in the okay. same way. Got it. Uh, there, is, there are narrations which talk about fasting for, mm -hmm. uh, attributed to the to the Imams, alayhim salam but usually Shi'is do not fast in the same way. So, But they do refrain from food and water. Usually what Shi'is do hmm. is they either uh, refrain from food and water until a bit after Dhuhr, okay, okay, uh, or uh, right before like Maghrib time, without the intention of fasting. So the intention of fasting isn't made mm -hmm. because if the intention of fasting is made, then you can't break the mm -hmm. fast. Uh, but they will ref in um, uh, solidarity, if I may use that term, to the uh, the thirst of the people and the martyrs of of Karbala. They would refrain on the, on Ashura mm -hmm. from food and drink okay. until after uh late in the afternoon after dhuhr in which they would usually in different cultures do different things some cultures you have some kind of sweet water uh with maybe like um like what we would consider chia seeds here with maybe some rose sprinkled in I there see. that's passed on to people as tabarruk um and and some other uh, uh cultures again until evening without the intention for fasting you open it with something simple um so but in the Shi'i tradition, generally, the the emphasis on fasting is not okay. present in the way that it is understood in in, in some Sunni traditions. Okay. Yeah. So then, maybe this is a good place to segue into perhaps some of the rituals then that are associated with uh, with commemoration. Sure, sure. Is that or or you have you want to talk more about the sort of historical record? Uh, and, and so, uh, well, I mean, the the one thing going back to the very sure. important point that you made I, about about the historical, like how history yeah. is, is maintained. In fact, it's interesting. Like when you were going over the sort of perspective, the first uh, approach uh, or opinion um, interpretation, if you will, among Shi is about the Sunni fasting and how it couldn't be possible or counts or suspect, etc. Et I can't help but think that there would also be sort of an undercurrent of skepticism around the fact that perhaps this was interpolation? Uh, interpolation. Interpolation later on to undermine the significance of Karbala. Is that a my, I don't know if that's a perspective, but is there? Is it? it is okay. In fact, uh, in fact, so that's there, just a good guess on my uh, part. I mean, that's that's <laughs> excellent. You, you're you're you you're 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 thinking uh, with with tremendous precision and care. Oh right? no, no, you don't uh, say so that. But, okay. Because we know historically, there are there are certain periods in which certain uh, interpolations, we can say concoctions. Uh, uh, pressures have come in through Muslim periods, right? We can talk about the Umayyad period. We can talk about the Abbasids. We can talk mm. about the Bawaihids. We can talk about the, the the Ottomans. We can talk about the Safavids, etc. Yeah. 
Throughout history. Throughout history. Even the the present day, how certain things, I mean, look at the way that in the Muslim world today, what countries are allowing or what people are willing to say about support for the Palestinians. Or permitted to say publicly. Or permitted to say publicly, right? (laughs) I mean, this is, this should, this should show us because sometimes I think we as Muslims say, well, no, I mean, that could, that couldn't have happened. How could people do something like that? (laughs) I mean, I call us as Muslims, we're in, we're entering the 10th month of a genocide. Yeah. And out of all these Muslim countries, there's only a few countries who are actually involved, mm-hmm. right? There's there's Hezbollah in Lebanon, there's mm-hmm. the, the Houthis in, in Yemen, there's Iraq, and there's there's Iran. I mean, this this devil speech to uh, to to Congress. Congress. Yeah. What is the constant uh, refrain? It's Iran, Iran. right? Yeah. But when you look at UAE, when you look at the Saudis, when you look at Egypt, when you look at Morocco, the the deals that they're making, the normalization, normalization. that I was about to have, all of these things that it's deeply problematic. Yeah. So yes, Shi'is will say that there is an attempt by the Umayyads to undermine the significance of the events of Karbala mm. as um, as a very a powerful moment and a yeah. powerful inspiration for Muslims to seek transformation and to confront the socio, political, economic, and religious wrongs that are happening in society. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so yes, that is definitely uh, okay. one 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 sure. one uh, sure. trend and, or one way of of approaching it. I think that if you, if you, if you're um, if you think that we've sufficiently covered the historical portion of it, and I know we can never do to true justice to something that is again as you described as a as as a watershed moment, not just like in Chi history, but just in history period. Yes, yes. So I mean let's be clear about that. I mean I don't think we could devote enough time to talk about, I think, the the historical significance and and and, and even discussing the historical events. But again, just for the sake of time, then it, you know, in what we have remaining, if we could sort of segue into a conversation around some of the more commemorative and venerative practices uh, among Shi'is, you know, around the events of Karbala and Muharram in particular. Absolutely, yeah. um, and even after, because I know the fortieth is coming up. Right, right. Yeah, uh, as we uh, record, Arba'in. Yes, yeah, Arba'in. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, for Shi'is, yeah. uh, the the month of Muharram is a month of deep, deep reflection. It's a month of mourning. Uh, Shi'is usually wear black in this month to signify mourning. Um, they don't have weddings uh, during the month of Muharram. They definitely don't have weddings uh, during the the first ten days of of, of Muharram. Some, uh, you know, although from the fiqh perspective, it's not haram to have a wedding in in this month, but they. They would generally consider it to be makruh, or they would discourage people to to engage in it again out of respect and and for sure. the memory of the ahlul bayt uh, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Shi'is go to the Islamic centers, the masajid, or or centers that are dedicated to these kinds of commemorations, the Husayniyas or the Takya uh, uh, to hear the retelling of the events of Karbala. This starts a bit uh, before in some instances, but usually the first 10 days are commemorated every night. And this has uh, a certain flow to it, a certain organization to it. The commemorations start with, uh, and it's, it's open to both men and women, children, everyone. It's a communal thing. The commemorations start with the recitation of the Quran. And then uh, there is the canonical prayers that are performed. There are also particular ziyarat uh, and and salutations that are recited, such as the ziyarat of Ashura uh, and the sending of salam, the sending of the salutation to uh, Imam al Hussein and his companions. The the shortest version of that is Assalamu ala al Hussein, wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein, wa ala awlad al Hussein, wa ala ashab al Hussein, wa jami' al shuhada, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The peace and blessings be mm-hmm. upon Hussein mm-hmm. and Ali, the son of Hussein, and the children of Hussein, and the companions of the Hussein, and all of the uh, shuhada, all of the martyrs, and you know, peace and blessings be upon uh, them and them. And then there is the recitation of of poetry in relation to Karbala, in relation to the person of Imam al-Hussein, 
then there are lectures, either one or multiple lectures that mm -hmm. happen. And then these lectures are very important because the lectures focus on Islamic teachings. So they focus on, for example, I just finished a, a 10 part, 11 night lecture series with a community in, in Sacramento. I was there for, for 11, 11 nights, uh, this Muharram, this, this, the opening of this month of Muharram, mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. My focus was on hikmah in the Quran. Um, so there's 10 nights that were focused on, uh, my lecture was focused on the process of hikmah and tadabbur according to the Quran. And in addition to this, the the commemoration of the lecture of the of the speaker uh, refers to the ways that injustice is present in society, mm. socially the the ills and the wrongs in our community, um, uh, religiously, politically, economically. Uh, these things are very much present. So there's always a way to, <clears throat> you know, the, the earlier narration that I mentioned that every land is Karbala, and every day is Ashura. That's right that there is this injustice that's active and the point and the uprising of the imam is to awaken people to shift and change their conditions no one else is going to do it for them right <clears throat> and then after the 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 lecture then there is what is referred to as dhikr or the re recollection of the masaib and the tribulations that befell the household of the prophet during muharram and in these retellings these these uh uh re uh uh, sort of uh, uh, capturing of that moment, the very vivid detail. Are these the ta'ziya, like the, uh, the the passion plays, if you will? The the, the ta'ziya are, ta are, are are different because okay. it's it's a reenactment. The ta'ziya is, is a reenactment, and that are, that occurs in some places. In some places, but okay. it doesn't happen usually in the West. Okay, uh, I see. It, in very very rare instances, the ta'ziya uh, appears in the in the West, but in in, in the East, the ta'ziya in some places is more prominent. In other places, it's not very prominent. Uh, for example, in Afghanistan, the ta'ziya is not very prominent. In I Iran, see. it is prominent. Mm. In Iraq, it is it is prominent in Lebanon not as not as and much. And these are actual reenactments? Like these are reenactment okay. actments that, that happen. Right. And this again, I mean, when you look at it's an absorption of, of local cultures, yeah. right? Um, and also then uh, uh, connecting that to Islamic historicity and, and Islamic mm -hmm. uh, history and the love of the Prophet. So there's always these 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 differentiations that happen, these colorings that happen based on where people are from, based on the local cultures and traditions and and, and other things. And this even takes its way into mourning, right? Right. Um, and so, so the, the Aza Muharram is that generally what all of these fall it under the rubric? captures everything. This so, is like the rubric that it all exactly. falls under. It all falls into so Which the recitation the, of the. Uh, like you said, the morning of Muharram, Aza exactly. Muharram. Okay. Exactly. Okay. It's the morning. Yeah, uh, sure. It is the retelling. Sure. It is the uh, the the reaffirmation, right, of this stance against injustice and oppressors and uh, oppression and oppressors. Um, so then, then there is a retelling of the occurrences. One of the companions, one event, something that the that the uh, that the imam said, something that was done to the imam, some violence, uh, etc. Okay. And then after that is done, after that is done by the speaker, then you either have another individual who is like a dhakir or someone who uh, retells in additional detail these, these uh, occurrences, or there's a recitation of a particular kind of uh, poetry yeah. that is referred to as like a rauza. Yes. Uh, and in fact, the very first kind of most prominent uh, rauza recitation or, or collection that we have is done by a Hanafi Sunni, Mala uh, Kashif uh, Waiz, that then gets absorbed into yeah. the, 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 the Shi'i sure. world. But these poems are accompanied by a very rhythmic recitation uh -huh. and a rhythmic beating of the chest. Okay. So the, the beating of the chest happens from uh, all of the uh, of those who are who are present. Right. Uh, so there is a very effective, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the retelling is not simply to convey history, but it's also to ignite this this uh, yeah. this intimate connection with the love and it's not uncommon for people to shed tears men and women right mm -hmm. so it becomes a, a very it's a it's an accumulation and it's an amalgamation of the physical 
of the emotional, of the imaginative, of the spiritual, of the ethical, of the political, right? Of the social. There's all these various aspects and, com and components that are related to it. But the the mourning and, and the beating of, of the chest at times then picks up with intensity, especially on, on the 10th. And it can go from anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes to an hour to two hours, sometimes even even uh, even longer. Um, so this is some of the the mourning that mm -hmm. that happens. And in addition to this, there's also the communal component in which in all of these nights and throughout these days, people um, um, generate and cook food. They pass out uh, water. Uh, which is a very prominent symbol in in uh, in, in Karbala. Mm -hmm. uh, they volunteer. Sometimes they volunteer at their local masajid. Sometimes they volunteer to uh, put up banners, uh, processions, and, and and other things. Yeah. Um, it is also seen as a place and a site of reformation. So it's not uncommon for people to be moved to change their lives as a result of the recognition of the sacrifice that Imam al Hussein uh, did for Islam and, and the, the emotional facet of the difficulties and the martyrdoms sure. that, that, that happen. Uh, and it's a very much, it's a very communal, very familial thing. It's not simply like some people are doing it. Everyone goes. And even for people who are not as present and as activated throughout the year the 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 10 days of muharram especially the 9th the 8th the 9th and the 10th more people come people. it's like you know just like in in, yeah. in, in ramadan oh, yeah. when it comes to the nights of qadr sure. people come it's the same thing yeah uh, is, sure, is, sure. is present there so, so there's a, a whole litany of sure of commemorative, venerative uh, acts that happen, but it's very important for some for the listeners to understand that the that the mourning ceremonies that happen or the programs that happen at Masajid by Shi'is, it's not just historical retelling. Yeah. There is an actual yeah. engagement with religion, sure. with the contents of the Quran, with hadith, with history, with the social and, and nobody sitting there taking notes and just being, oh, it's it's more of an it's a it's meant to it's be a connection. Thing. Right. It's meant to be transformative, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah as yeah, opposed to way. just informative, exactly. like if that. you will. Um, I had a question. So, I would imagine in the United States or in the West, perhaps in general, all, all of these majalis happen in like sort of Islamic centers that are masajids, that are communal centers. Right. But in the Muslim world, are are there differences between, like, say, mosques? And uh, Ashur Khanas or, or uh, Azah Khanas, like places where these type of things occur. Right, right. Um, so the the Azah Khanas, yeah. the Hussainiyas, and, and, and so forth, the Ashur Khana, mm -hmm. uh, Imam Bargas, like different yeah. people, Tekkes, uh, yeah. you know, different places have different different terms for, for them. Yeah, um, like in Hyderabad, it's, it's the Azah Khana, Azah like Khana. From, our, from our background, yeah. yeah. Um, Azah Khana Zahra is a very prominent one in Hyderabad that was built by the seventh Nizam. You know, mm -hmm. Usman Ali Basha. And, and I mean, it's worth noting, I, I mean, since we're on the topic of, sorry, Hyderabad, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I mean, I think you'll find this fascinating as well. I mean, you know, certainly the uh, the latter Ima uh, Nizams were very, um, there, was a very, there was a very sort of syncretic approach to Sunni Shi'i tradition, right. where, for example, Usman Ali Khan, who was the last, or, was, or the seventh Nizam, he, public displays and public participation in what would be considered, generally speaking, Shi'i practices was norm, was norm. In fact, uh, this Azah Khan Zahra that I mentioned was built in commemoration of his mother or in, uh, or in memory of his mother, but this was meant to be a place where particular acts of remembrance would occur for the Shi'i community. You know, specifically also in Hyderabad, you have the phenomenon that occurs on the 10th of Muharram known as Bibi Ghalam. I mentioned it earlier. Uh -huh, right, okay. Yeah, Bibi Ghalam, which is very interesting. I, I, and I, I, I witnessed this. I, when I went in 92, uh, me and my friend were visiting and we were able to observe uh, this uh, that uh, that happens and it's an elephant and it leaves with a particular relic that traces back to Karbala and then it commemorates at a particular location in Hyderabad. And then there is where you also have the occurrence of the self-flagellation, which I, I do want to certainly talk about or ask you sure. about, um, the Matam. But yeah, so, I mean, uh, again, coming from a Hyderabadi background, 
for me, you know, there was a lot of sort of, like I said, syncretism between Sunni and Shi practices. Right. Um, in fact, this idea of not holding celebrations in Muharram, completely commonplace among yeah. people from the subcontinent. My grandmother yeah. that, that I grew up with, she would go to the, uh, on, during Muharram, she would go with, whether she had friends who were Shia or whatever, she would go and cry and, yeah, and right. participate Absolutely. essentially right. and it wasn't that's not that wasn't considered like a bad thing and by any all. means it was right. just like part of the community yeah it was norm i mean yeah, I, right. exam, yeah same thing on my side of the family as well and on, as on i a, noted you know this this was the same case and in, in afghanistan this also right. happened in many instances in the ottoman world and other places yes. which is important to understand right because i think again as you as you're pointing out this is not as much as this we're talking about uh, the Shi'i perceptions and the Shi'i sort of uh, performance around right. the commemorations and the mourning ceremonies. Mm -hmm. It's important to sustain the very rich and very connected and connective history in which Muslims of all shades and all, of all stripes and colors uh, actually recognize this, right? Mm. Uh, and now, unfortunately, there is a uh, a hardening of divisions in many ways where it's seen that if you mention uh, the mourning ceremonies around uh, Imam al Hussein and, and the events of Karbala without the emphasis on fasting, right? Or, or even in addition to it or giving it the same kind of importance, then you consider it to be pseudo Shi'i or Shi'i, uh, Shi'i adjacent, all of these, these mm. terms that happen. Yeah. And in some ways, you know, some scholars that I've spoken with, you know, Sunni scholars, they point out that there's real pressure, both from the community and also from others within scholarly circles, that you should not talk about this to the public because it will then generate a certain number of curiosities and questions or problems that we don't want to have. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point. I almost want to end on that point. But I think, uh, yeah, th there was something I wanted to say for the conclusion to talk about this idea. You know, I mentioned this sort of syncretic approach, right. because I think kind of what we're seeing, unfortunately, is this, uh, this, this rise of a monochromatic, if you will, uh, sort of approach that is very antithetical to this idea of syncreticism where whatever you know name you want to give it but the idea being that there's only sort of one way to do anything right. and and the idea and there's no place for culture there's no place for sort of a syncretic approach to religion if you will and i think we've certainly seen the rise of that in modern times and, I agree. And, and that re has resulted in the the kind of fissures that we see in the community. I agree. And yeah. and I think uh, it's also complicated by yeah. um, visual misrepresentations or ah. what is allowed to be representative, right? So it, let's it, talk about like one example being sure. the, the Mata. Sure. Right? That sort of becomes this real symbol for Sunnis to be d dismissive or right. der derisive of Shia practices because people do these type of self-flagellation and in these type of practices, which in some instances can be bloody and can include weapons mm -hmm. and blades, right? I mean, again, absolutely, I, right? Yeah, and and you know, for for any so, of the viewers who may not know, the term refers to any kind of contact with the body, okay. either through the hand or through another. Object. Uh, object that would lead to pain or marking or, or, or anything along those lines. Sure. Uh, I would say that the visual representation uh, of what she is engaged in okay. during Muharram and for the for the events of Karbala, unfortunately, in a good percentage of Sunni imagination, immediately goes towards the issue of self-flagellation yeah. and um, you know, chains and swords right. and blood. Sure. Uh, and I may not blame the, the 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 regular population who has that kind of view, unless people have really kind of wicked ulterior motives engaged with in a derisive uh, and you know dehumanizing component, which unfortunately is also is oh, also there. Hundred I, I sometimes I always try to give examples that are more palpable and immediate. Right. Imagine some random. American Westerner coming to you and say, oh, you Muslims, oh, you guys just blow yourselves up. 
because in the in the misrepresentation of Muslims, I mean right. Sa Saeed's very famous uh, book on the representations and the misrepresentations of Islam in the media and, and others sure, sure. is very prominent as to how do we decide what uh, visuals can be attached next to particular uh, names, exactly. next to particular nouns. Right. And just like for the Muslim, it's like the naqab, or it's the the acts of suicide bombings, or the acts of like someone yelling in anger, or sand, and so forth. Well, mm -hmm. The common Muslim would say, well, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, we can say that some people that we would consider to be deviants engage in this, but that's not what Muslims really engage with, right? Right. And for, but when you ask a Shi'i, display to us or or describe to us the the key symbol sure. of of your commemorations uh, they will talk about the lectures they will talk about community they will talk about the food that is prepared the acts right. of selflessness the love and devotion the the kind of call towards reformation and these types of symbolism and also the shedding of tears and in a real connectivity to emotion right because at times there is unfortunately a disconnect and severance uh, of Muslims, and it's particularly Muslim men, around shedding tears and crying, wherein in the events of Muharram and Karbala, from the speaker to the regular audience, it is very much normal for people to shed tears, right? Mm -hmm. But the 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 number of people who engage in the usage of you know cutting or the usage of flagellation, self-flagellation, and so forth with chains or with knives, is very very little throughout the uh, I in my years of being in, in in various communities being in various Muslim lands um, I've seen it once with chains right I've never seen actually anyone using using knives and from within the scholarly tradition the 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 highest of of, of religious scholars within the Shi'i tradition you have two camps okay you have one camp which considers it to be absolutely haram. And within that camp, you have, you know, kind of giants within the uh, the, the Shi'i uh, intellectual tradition, uh, such as Ayatollah Uzma Asif, Sheikh Asif Muhsini, Ayatollah Uzma Bayat Sanjani, you have individuals like Makarim Shirazi, uh, Sanai, uh, individuals like Jawadi Amuli, and even uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, mm. right, the, the current uh, uh, supreme leader, spiritual leader of, of, of the Islamic uh, uh, Republic of Iran, have come out openly denouncing and saying that it's, it's absolutely haram to engage in this. And they usually cite two things about okay. the history of it. One is that they say no such practice existed during the time of the imams. Okay. Any of the imams, right? The 11 imams, the, the, the current imam that we're in. So there's no historical precedence either in the text and the tradition of the imams themselves. That's number one. Number two is that they'll say that, so that, should denounce it in itself. Number two, they'll say is that the practice is extreme and it causes harm to the self, right? The third thing is they'll say that it it is used by people who are against the Shi'is to misrepresent mm. and to mock our tradition. Uh, so they say for these three reasons and, and many more, mm -hmm. that this is actually a <coughs> dangerous thing to do. Right. Within the particular regions and particular areas or people who do this, they say, we don't care. I mean, really that comes down to this because for them, it's really representative of what they think Muharram and, and loyalty and kind of love mm. is. They will argue that say that, well, no, the body of the Imam was hurt. Mm. The family of the prophet were, were whipped. This is nothing. They'll say that they, that they were chained. And there are some narrations that they'll cite. They'll say that, that the, the mourning and the re recollection of what happened to the Imam and others were so much that at one point, those who were chained took those chains and they hit themselves with it. But from a scholarly uh, perspective, and that, that is not, Sure. historically sound no scholar looks at this uh i mean scholar who's worth their 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 name looks at this and says oh this is actually what happened these right. are mythical kind of components that are generated to form a justification mm. around it so i would say that it is not only wrong and incorrect to center those images but the centering of such images if you did a google search a couple of years ago i haven't done one recently i think even up until two years when you look when you search ashura uh -huh. most of the images that come up are people 
who are bloodied yeah. or who are uh, who are with this. And when you see this, you're like, okay, well, maybe this is what they do. But this mm-hmm. is not not the case. If you go to any of the centers, uh, you actually don't see uh, mm-hmm. that. There's also questions around, of course, from the fiqh perspective, around the purity of blood, blood being in masajid. Sometimes people will do it outside. Sometimes they'll do it in homes and in, in, the, in the public and so forth. But I can say overwhelmingly that, uh, and this is also the view that I have, that the usage of knives, the usage of even chains uh, is uh, is disallowed within the Shi'i tradition. There is no historical basis for it. There is no uh, you know akli need for it. There is no nakli need for it, sure. uh, and it is sufficient to simply use the morning using the hands and and to hit the chest, which is. So symbolic, if you which will. is symbolic. Yeah. It is also something that was present. We know that the the people mourned, and we know that in Arab tradition as well, there is the hitting of the chest. I mean, there's instances right now in Palestine of people who are doing it or lightly hitting hitting the head. That uh, to to symbolically represent mourning and grief and loss is definitely mm-hmm. is definitely. Uh, present and there's also a mystical component to the hitting of the chest and I and I offer this as something that you know I, I work on uh, and inshallah it'll be an article or maybe a short treatise is the the centrality of the heart in Karbala mm. so the hitting of the heart is also an, an attempt to revive the heart an attempt mm. to awaken the heart to what is happening both to self what is happening inside of me and then also what is happening outside the self. So there is a very deep connection to a sort of tazkiyah that is physical, a connectiveness from the outside to the inside, from the inside back out uh, or to, uh, to the outside. You know what I find fascinating, uh, just again as an as a outside observer, if you will, is that generally the perspective that um, uh, Sunnis have about Shi tradition is that it is so centralized, right? Because authority is so centralized that you don't see the kind of um, you know divisions or differences of opinion or approaches, but what you're describing sounds like a pretty uh, pluralistic sort of approach, even just around practices associated with Muharram. Right. What is generally tolerated? What isn't? What is frowned upon? Or that even if scholarly literature has presented this position, you may have people who say, you know what, we don't care. Right. We do this out of love or right. we do this out of devotion. So it dispels this notion, I guess it was what I'm trying to say, that I think people outside of Shiism have, uh, or specific Sunnis have, with regards to their Shi brethren, which is that it is so centralized. It is generally, um, you don't see a lot of like khilaf and differences of practice. But, but you're saying that's not the case, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's, that's enriching. Correct. I mean, I think that's. I mean, we, you know, for, for Sunnis, that is seen as a sign of a mature tradition that celebrates pluralism, etc. So I think the fact that that is found not just within Sunni thought, but also within Shi thought right. is, like I said, would be something that I think for some of our listeners may be like news, you know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I, I want to maybe end on, on, this, on this reflection, on this point is that Muharram in Karbala is an opportunity and an opening for us Muslims, let's just focus on Muslims for now, yeah. us Muslims, Shi'i and Sunni, to come together and confront the fallacies that are present in our communities and in this Ummah. Yeah. This can be at a ethical, spiritual level, at a political level, at an economic level, uh, confronting the, the deep ills and wrongs that are there uh, in our communities. You know, I, I pray that inshallah in my lifetime, I see the increase of programs during Ashura, and during the month of Muharram, of Shi'is and Sunnis coming together and listening talking about the the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu was salam. Um, Sunnis don't have to, you know, hit their chests uh, or do anything like that. That's not what I mean. But we can talk about this history. We can talk in a res- respectful manner. We can hear from both sides. We can allow the audience to hear from both sides. And I think this would be much more productive for us as Muslims, right? And to go, you know, I invite folks to go and attend, to go and and, and listen, to go and, and understand and to question from, from all sides, because we are really in need of change. We, we, are, we are in really in need of, of growth and of, and of transformation. 
And then I think also there's a deeply mystical and they're deeply poetic uh, relation to, to Muharram and, and mm -hmm. Karbala. The amount of poetry that is recited, I mentioned briefly, you know, historically, but also in the modern times in various languages, in Arabic, uh, in Farsi, in Urdu, of course, in Turkish. Anyone uh, who's a fan of like Qawali of music, course, and, for example, Qawali, and, and, Qawali music, and, right, it's, it's right. replete. Of course. Uh, of course. The idea, there, right. No, there is... Uh, I was listening a lot uh, today because you were explaining it in, in, in such a clear way. Not just clear; it was it, you. I think for the really for the first time, you I, I understand the transformative effect. Mm -hmm. um, and what I was thinking about was, you know, we all all Muslims love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if you love somebody, you love who they love the most. Right. And that that to me, in and of itself, is an important good enough reason to, to commemorate these events. And then, of course, the, the spiritual and transformative effects that you talked about, at a minimum, understand and commemorate. Just listening to you, I, I held my other kind of questions, uh, which we can potentially revisit in a future podcast, uh, just about, uh, you know, the, the relationships between the communities and mm -hmm. within America, abroad. But we'll hold those. We'll hold those for another podcast. What do you think, Provost? Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, and and I wanted to echo what Umar said. I, I I think that you know the refrain sometimes within within Sunnis, and this might get me in trouble, but I don't know, I'm going to just say it anyway. And I don't mean by you. I mean by maybe some some who are listening, which is that any Sunni tradition or any Sunni scholar worth their salt will discusses or underscores the importance of added bait in our tradition. I think that's true to an extent, but I think it would be undeniable that the kind of veneration that we see, the kind of centrality that we see uh, to Ahlul Bayt uh, among Shi'i thought and, and Shi'i imagination, I mean, there's just no comparison. Even I would say among the most ardent of like sort of devotees of uh, Ahlul Bayt among Sunnis, there's, there's a gulf of a difference between the two. And so I think to Umar's point, you know, if you want to see devotion to Ahlul Bayt, then we have to seriously examine the sort of Shi perspective of it. And I think that, so and, like and said, just a it's small objectively example, objectively un, undeniable. Yeah, object just objectively speaking. If you take a group of Sunnis and a group of Shias, who who knows specific names more? Thank you. Right of. Yeah. Yeah, the literacy of the about the family, which we sh we all should know, should know, uh, but we are lacking in many cases. Exactly. Like I mean, you and I were talking off mic, and we 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 deliberately said we were going to avoid getting into some of the historical record around what occurs after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu peace be upon him. But like you know, Fadak and what happens during the selection of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Right. These are and, and these are found abundantly in the in the Sunni tradition. These are in the in the in the Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Tirmidhi, etc. Sunnis are largely unaware of those things. Like if you were to say Fadak and what occurs, what is it? Just tell me, just tell me generally what is Fadak about and the dispute that occurred. A lot of people won't know. Right. Shias, on the other hand, I would argue, or I, I would I would be curious to ask you if even the sort of nominal of of of, of Shi'is would understand Fadak yes. and what occurs. And why that's important, right? It's very, it's very central again to yeah. uh, within within Shi'i reading and, of history, no. the the wrongs that are done to the family of the Prophet is yeah. a very, very important uh, manifestation of history, yeah. of how history is uh, unfolds after the Prophet. It's seen as as betrayals. What, yeah, and, what, if, and if you're listening, I would say either Google Fadak or you know go consult a history book. Right. Uh, the, the the Cliff Notes version is there's a dispute that occurs that the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Fatima, brings to the authority, you know, to Abu Bakr over a parcel of land, right. which is Fadak, and which was a piece of land that was promised to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And we can, again, there's a whole discussion here, but the Cliff Note version, again, is that she was denied her inheritance to or claim of inheritance to Fadak um, by Abu Bakr. Right. And extension by Omar. So and you yeah, you mentioned yeah. one thing that stuck out. You said it's a cosmic event. Mm. And I think as a Sunni, if I'm thinking about the, something like that happening to the grandchild of the most beloved person to Allah, that's a cosmic event. So yeah. 
you know, like I said, taking taking I think just the historical importance cannot be understated. Absolutely. And, and has been understated. That, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think for far too long, you know, uh, you know, these things have been sort of talked about in hushed tones in Sunni circles outside of, like you said, like maybe certain uh, Sufi or, or practices, et cetera. Because I think going back to that, what I presented earlier, whether it's whatever label you want to give it, Wahhabism, uh, monochromatic sort of approach to religion, which doesn't, which denies plurality, whatever may be the case or whatever label you want to use, it, it's, it, it has served as a tight, like as a stranglehold on allowing these type of conversations around Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Ad Bayt, et cetera, to take place among Sunni circles. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a future podcast episode right. for Biz, but there's so, there's, this is just one example of things that sometimes Muslims avoid talking about. Absolutely. Because of an insecurity or a, what if I talk about this, then all yeah. these potential fears could be unraveled. There's, yeah. there, it just goes to show that sometimes if you educate and then you, then you can talk about things if you have the, the, the knowledge that That's comes right. uh, as a prerequisite. Right, absolutely. But, Thank so, you. Rashid, thank, thank you, you so yeah. much. I know. I think uh, we're on a marathon of like a three-hour <laughs> podcast. This uh, is like Joe Rogan territory. Uh, uh, you know, I, I thank you, gentlemen, for yeah. both the invitation and the sincerity. That's and our the, pleasure. The, the really beautiful way that you engage and conducted this this conversation. I felt, you know, really I, I was speaking with two friends uh, and it was a very natural and and, and uh, really enjoyable conversation as much as we were talking about something so disturbing and, and so Absolutely. tragic. Uh, it would, I would, I would regret the fact of not mentioning this one thing that came to mind, Please. if I may. Uh, the oldest extant uh, Sufi commentary that we have in the Persian language is a commentary on Kalabadi's Madhab uh, Ahl Tasawwuf, right? Which is the very first Arabic uh, organization of Irfan and of, of Tasawwuf that is done by this individual from Bukhara, right? Bukhara is such a prominent place. But Bukhara is also a Farsi speaking place historically, right? So we hear things like the 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 conversations around the first translation from Arabic into Farsi, which in it now we have translations in every language, hmm. but this was actually seen as an impossibility. Right. And there was a, a, almost an obscene thing to consider engaging with the Quran in another language. So there's an individual by the name of Mustamli Bukhari. He writes a uh, a sharh, the very first sharh that we have extant again, most likely the oldest uh, or one of the very earliest that's written um, on a Sufi text. Mm. Okay, so he takes uh, Kalabadi's text, the Arabic, and then offers this commentary on it. This commentary, I mean, the Kalabadi's text is a very short text. If you've read it, the Mustamli's uh, sharh, sharh is, is three volumes. <laughs> um, in right. this. And and in this, there is a reference to Imam al Hussein that he offers in his sharh. And it is one of the most unique expressions that really paint for you and I that in this period, far removed, Sunnis, Sufis, understood the events of Karbala as a very prominent thing tied to Ashura. In it, he says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the, the pen to write upon the lawah of all of the things that are going to happen in this world, when it comes to the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein, who, who in the Sunni tradition is referred, excuse me, in, this, in the Shi'i tradition is referred to as Sayyid al Shuhada, that the pen pauses. The pen pauses and says, this cannot happen. How is it that that Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, the beloved of the Prophet, right? And as we know, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his used to kiss Imam al-Hussein, ride him on his shoulder, mm -hmm. right? And um, the, from the Shi'i historic perspective, prolonged it is known, sajda, pro prolonged sajda, and all, all of these right, other yeah, narrations, yeah. etc. Right, right. Is the pen says, well, this can't, this can't happen. I mean, this is this is too much. It really is un unfathomable. And this is where something happens very interestingly. Look at the the the, the symbolism, the visual. They said that the pen is cut 
to signify the martyrdom and the beheading of Hussein, and from that day onward until the very end of time, when a pen writes, it is cut. So imagine a reed, you know, the reed pens that are that are written, and they always have to be cut. Mm -hmm. And with that cutting is then when the pen can become an instrument of writing and the black uh, ink representing knowledge and even on that instance, lawh to the 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 blood of mm -hmm. Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi and his martyrdom. Mm -hmm. So it's a very profound yeah. interconnection, uh, a confluence that happens, right? And again, for us as as human beings as as individuals especially when we're looking at the extreme theater of violence and the absurd that is happening i really do think as you pointed out and and as you also mentioned that it's an opportunity for us to kind of revisit things right mm -hmm. and 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 to recenter ourselves and in, in this tradition um again before we let you go though um but we, we often like to ask our guests, where can people find you, engage you, um, maybe come across some of your writings, sure. et cetera. So if you could please uh, allow our listeners to, to you know, the, um, the ability to do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am at the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California in, in Oakland. Uh, I have uh, the, 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 the center has a YouTube channel, uh, ICCNC. If you just put uh, I, Islamic Center, cultural uh northern california mm -hmm. uh iccnc uh you will see the the recorded lectures the weekly the weekly juma khutbas that are both broadcast live and then you can find the recordings of it there's uh, a, an entire archive there individuals can listen to that i invite them to listen to those lectures uh inshallah i hope it's of, of benefit i do have a, a book on islam that's called islam explained that is very much an accessible primer uh both you know it's it's written for both muslims and non-muslims uh, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a primer it's a short book but it engages with many topics um, and then i have a number of uh of scholarly articles that are that are available a couple of book chapters that are that are coming out inshallah and in, in my academic work, uh, in addition to, of course, you know, a lot of engagement in, in tasawwuf, I also deal a lot with uh, with uh, religion and politics, language and mm -hmm. and, and politics. Um, and then, you know, I, I I have a chapter that's coming out on on uh, Ashura and its uh, reception in, in the poetic tradition. Uh, I should also note that for individuals who are interested in the Farsi language, and uh, you know. Farsi literature, particularly poetry, uh, I do run a an online a language institute referred to as Alif Institute, A L E double F F F Institute. There's a website, alifinstitute.com. There's also an Instagram page for that. So that is something uh, there. And uh, in addition to language acquisition of, of Farsi for non heritage speakers as, as, well as, as well as heritage speakers, and it's designed like a college course. Wow. Uh, I also offer uh, Persian language classes and translation. So both, so classes on Maulana, Balkhi, on aka Rumi, right. uh, uh, and uh, on individuals like Saadi and, and others. So for those who have an interest in wanting to have an immersive uh, engagement with the primary text in translation and, and with that, I would offer them to get in contact and I'm happy to have them there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Persian is like high culture. So uh, yes. yeah, I encourage everyone to check that out. <laughs> so, Please do. Yeah. And it's open to all ages. So yes. And inshallah, if anyone else has um, needs or questions, you can find my email uh, online. Sure. And uh, I'm happy to engage with, with folks. And How about social media? Do you have any? I don't you know, have social active? media. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, okay. I don't have any sort of public facing social sure. media pages sure. uh, or, or accounts. Uh, but those would be the best ways to kind of get a contact with me. And finally, what's next for you, sort of academically? You're like you're almost finishing up your like yeah. your dissertation, your PhD. Yes, uh, I'm an advanced candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, this fall and a couple of months, I'm going on the job market. Uh, so please keep me near du'as. Uh, inshallah. inshallah, the way that it works in academia is you apply in the fall, you hear back in the spring, and then you start in the next fall. Okay. Uh, so inshallah, I hope to land a tenure track job and 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 stay in academia as well as the engagements that I do with the community and, and the broader Muslim community, uh, and. Uh, 
uh, you know, I, I hope to continue writing, continue learning and, and growing, inshallah. I thank all of, both of you for this opportunity and, and the listeners for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us and accept from us and grant us sincerity and tawfiq, inshallah, in increasing in the love of the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt and the Ashab and the Awliya, inshallah. Yeah. Thank you so much, as always, uh, listeners, for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, feedback, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Um, thank you, as always, for your support and your kind words and for encouraging others to listen and we will catch you on the next episode of Peace the Girls. Thank <laughs> you.